Hi, hello and welcome, guys, to a new video, a new reaction once once again. Um, in the last weeks, I often just played um, Trails of Cold Steel, Trails of Cold Steel Run, and now Trails of Cold Steel Two. If you want to see this playthrough, please just um, check out the link in the description. You can also just go to my YouTube channel and um, find it there, probably right on the front page. Um, yeah, Trails of Cold Steel, a wonderful game, in my opinion. My personal opinion, on the same level or even above it, than Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, which was a wonderful, awesome game. Um, of course, the games are very different um, in their design, in gameplay, everything, but uh, I enjoyed them similar, in a similar way, and maybe even Trails of Cold Steel. Um, in general, it's a series, so um, 1, 2, 3, and 4, more than Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Um, for some of you, is this is maybe an insult to Witcher 3 Right Hand, but yeah, just check it out if you are interested um, in role playing game and in Japanese role playing game, anime role playing game. Um, the link in the description to the playlist or either the first episode or the most re recent episode. I'm not sure, but either way, this video is about geography now, the United States of America. A very important country in the current world, whether you know like the United States or not, they have a large influence on economy, in diplomacy, and military in the world. Maybe not for much longer. Who knows? Um, I think uh, at some point in the century, China will probably take them over in most categories. But who knows? The history will show us. The future will show us. But it's also not important right now. This. Mm, Right now it's only important that I am German, um, I'm also Euro I'm a fan of Europe, at least um, in some ways. Many things are very, um, not very good in Europe or um, function in a very um, unfair way towards more poor countries like Greece um, and other countries which suffered from the um, Euro um, German focused um, economy of Europe. But um, the idea of Europe, I like very much. I'm a communist, as you see here. Maybe you can see it, the uh, hammer and sickle. I think communism would be um, a wonderful thing for the world, for the people in the world, and um, yeah, for everyone. It would um, benefit everyone, everyone, and everyone have, would have a chance um, for higher education, for uh, peace and for um, solidarity, for personal um, reaching um, goals and um, yeah, I think it would be um, the best um, economic, economical, um, the best economy solution, so and everyone would have a share um, benefit of the economy of all of the things which get produced and um, so on. But I can make another video specifically about this later. This is about um, the United States of America. And I wear this t-shirt also specifically for the United States of America. So for all of you guys who think communism is um, pure evil or so, maybe you can learn something. I would recommend not so much a video from me, but a video from Second Soul. I think he makes it, makes it, makes it much better than me. I can possibly do it. Um, I will also, of course, try to convince you to to um to communism. Uh, you can also ask me uh, any questions you have about communism, socialism, and so on. And I will try to answer them as best as best as I can. But other people are better in this. But I will try if you have any questions. But now this video, this intro is very long. The video is very long, one hour and five minutes. So my reaction will be maybe double the length. I'm not sure. It could be very easily double or two and a half times as long as this video. So if you watch this through, you are a real big fan of the United States and are interesting, interested in other people's opinion about them, or you are a big fan of me, which would be nice in both ways. Um, sp specifically, of course, the second one, when you would be a fan of me on my YouTube channel. Anyway, please have a like and subscribe if you enjoy this one. And I would say... say in five seconds, we start this video. Four, three, two, one. Hmm. 
I guess <laughs> I guess this will be a very big episode for him. Also, something I like very much and something um I appreciate very much when I watch reactions from other people. Please always pause when you have to say something. Anything, if, even if it's stupid what to say. Pause and then start the reaction again. Because, yeah, the video deserves this to be um, also um, listened and seen. So, pause. Like, I paused now very quickly. But uh, if, if I'm interested in a certain topic and uh, other people's opinion about the topic, I also watch a reaction which is double the length or three times as long. Um, because I'm interested. Otherwise, not. But then I also don't watch it if you um, talk into the video. So, yeah. Let's continue. I guess it's the national anthem. Um, I mean it's okay, but compared to other national anthems in the world, it's not as good as, um, for example, the Soviet anthem. My personal opinion. Everyone has its own opinion. Um, that's very personally, but uh, French and I mean German is also a stupid anthem. Has also a stupid anthem, boring and so. So I'm not sure. I've also not listened to it so much. So maybe I, I just don't. See the beautiful parts of it. Okay, maybe I make it a bit more quiet. What was this? This is a broken, uh, um, how to say this, uh, this um, staircase which is moving. It looks like a, a broken building or something like this. Maybe I'm wrong. A definitive from the landscape. landscape. You can um, not deny that the United States have some beautiful areas, but I mean it's a very large country, so um, it's not anything too surprising. And also other m m very large countries, like for example China and Russia, have beautiful um, places like um, sceneries, landscapes. So that's not anything special. It's a whole anthem to begin the of the video because if he uploaded it on the 4th of July, Independence Day, or is it uh, not true? But let's see. A bit behind the scenes, you could see um, how the studio looks like. That's like funny. You see, I'm, I'm just uh, one half minute into the video, and my reaction is already 10 minutes long, nearly. But I, I will maybe pause later, less so it, it's okay. Everybody, I'm your host, Barbs. By the way, you can get Geography Now merch like this Geography Now shirt at geographynow.com. Not selling out if it's your brand. So we did the UAE, the UK, and now the last of the United Triplet countries. After doing this channel for nearly a decade of my life, it's finally time. We have made it to my home country. Let's make this a big one. Here we go. Welcome to the United States of America. The US. 
Um, I am very um happy to be welcome to, to the United States episode, um um to the country, um virtually. I would probably not never I will probably never travel there, unless maybe certain things change. But or I have a really re important reason to go there. But yeah, let's see. USA is a very complex place when it comes to the way that it's structured and the way that the domain administers itself. It's almost like 50 mini countries and five territories with their own unique identities, yet they all speak the same language and have some common understanding of American life. Everything is bigger, wider, spread out. We love shopping and having everything conveniently available now. I mean, that's why we invented things like fast food, the parking lot, the modern shopping mall, highway service plazas, drive throughs the barcode pricing system, credit cards, escalators, and public restrooms are- Esc Escalators, escalators is the, the name of this um, the thing. Um, thank you. Are everywhere and they're free. In any case, apart from that little civil structure overview, let's look at the map and discuss the actual location and sovereignty of the USA, shall we? First of all, the USA is located on the North American continent, with the main chunk of the country, known as the Lower 48, where 98% of the population lives, is sandwiched between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to the east and west, and Canada and Mexico border them on the north and south. The country consists of 50 states divided into 3,143 counties, or 341 See, 3,143 counties. Um, imagine you would need to learn them by heart. <laughs> this would be funny. County equivalents, 3,243 if you include territory divisions. Three states have weird detached exclaves on the Canadian border. They are the Northwest Angle and Elm Point for Minnesota, Point Roberts, Washington, and Alberg, Vermont. The only state distinctly divided into two continental land-based units is Michigan, with the upper and lower peninsulas. The capital of the country is Washington, D.C., which is a federal district not belonging to any state and is under direct control of Congress, despite having a higher population than some states. In addition, the USA has five major unincorporated territories, they are Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. In addition, there are nine minor outlying islands, all of which are also unincorporated, except for Palmyra Atoll for some reason, even though all these islands have no permanent population. The U.S. has a disputed claim over two small sandbank islands in the Caribbean as well, both administered by Colombia, they are the Serenia Bank and the Bajo Nuevo Bank as well. That being said, this means if you include all the territories and dependency, the USA has a total of 11 time zones. Zones, although only nine of them are used by people. Two strange time zone anomalies exist, the first one being the Little and Big Diomede Islands. Um, 11 time zones uh, with all of the um, places outside of the, of the um, big ones like um, Alaska and the, uh, um, and the main lower 48. Um, I think this would only uh, France, France was 13, oh? I'm not sure. But uh, France had also with overseas territories a lot of time zones between Alaska and Russia, and American Samoa and Samoa. The Diomedes are less than three miles away and are visible to each other, yet they straddle the international date line and are hence an entire day apart from each other. In addition, there are 325 Native American reservations spread throughout the lower 48. These areas, although under U.S. federal territory, have a degree of autonomy for the Native tribes that administer them. The largest cities in the USA population-wise are New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. The busiest airports, however, are Atlanta, Hartsfield-Jackson, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Denver international. The U.S. has an incredibly wide network of roads and highways connecting all states except Hawaii, obviously, the longest one being U.S. Route 20. Although the U.S. does have a relatively wide rail network for freight trains, passenger train lines have decreased over the years in favor of road transport, and today the only long-distance intercity network is operated by Amtrak. Our largest shipping port is the Port of Los Angeles in conjunction with the Port of Long Beach, which are two separate entities yet physically joined. And finally, one last thing, although the U.S.A. has no claim over Antarctica, we we do have the largest Antarctic station at McMurdo, which can facilitate up to a thousand people, and we also have the only station located on the geographic South Pole at Edmonton Scott Station. And in case if you were wondering, it follows the plus 12 UTC time zone. Fun fact, did you know that in Hawaii it's actually illegal to laugh loudly, so you kind of have to keep it at aloha. <laughs> Few side notes. One, I made a video explaining the Native American reservations and statistical areas as well as territories of the USA. I figured they deserve their own videos because... Maybe I will also watch them. I, I guess I will watch them as well. Um, yeah, the episode by the way came out guess, yesterday, um, on I Independence Day, Fourth of July. Um, but I watched it today. I had other things to do. I was yesterday playing this wonderful game. If you want to, as I said before, um, watch me playing this game. It's a playlist.
enjoyed very much and um, better you know and um, watch me because my voice is so wonderful or nice or I'm not sure or you like the game either way if you do uh, please like the video and subscribe also if you enjoyed uh, of course because it's a big topic check them out two each state and territory has their own flag license plate design and nickname yes it's the flags and um, something i have heard about the flags often very often is that they a lot a large amount of them look very boring it's just blue with something in the middle mm. my favorite flags when i, when I see this from here uh um I think it's uh, ne not Nevada, not Nevada. It's just Arizona. This um here with a uh, um star in the middle and um, like a rising sun a bit. Um, from New Mexico, it also looks nice. And Maryland at least is very um creative. So um, and, and California with a with a big bear. That's also nice. There are a few more probably which are nice, but. The all the blue ones are I think a bit boring, but yeah. Yeah, this this white one. I'm not sure which is uh, what it is, but it also looks nice. For example, the state I was born in, Minnesota, is the land of ten thousand lakes. Indiana, I still have no idea what a Hoosier is, but you do. But this flag looks also nice. You cities have nicknames too, like Chicago is Chi Town or the Windy City, New York the Big Apple, Orlando the Big Orange, Seattle is the Emerald City, and so on. Three, yes, the USA is a car country, it's part of our culture. See, the majority of our country was built post industrial revolution, so many of our cities have easily navigable straight grid like road networks with accommodating wider roads as opposed to the spider web of narrow medieval cobblestone alleys built for pedestrians. In the US, you can get your own license at age 16. For many of us, it's a rite of passage and bragging right in high school to show off your car, even if you're just borrowing mom's minivan. Four. We also kind of have an awkward. Ah, yeah, Guantanamo Bay. Something I was, uh, I am um, uh, curious about. I mean, as with the car, I, it's okay. I don't understand this. Um, I would personally not give so much about it. But in the United States, it's, yeah, it's, it's maybe more important than in Europe. Um, because of public transportation system. And here it is much better in Europe than in the United States. About Guantanamo Bay. As I'm not sure why Cuba allows this to happen. Maybe they cannot retake it, maybe they don't want it, or it would be too much of, of uh, trouble. But I don't understand why Cuba allows uh, this um, torture and this terrible things which happen there to happen. Of course, the United States is doing this, but the Cuba allows this to happen. It's on their island, it should be their responsibility in a certain way also to either um, expel the Americans from there, or just to reclaim it. It is their island. It should be, um, or, or ask the United States to leave and um, uh, do the war crimes or the terrible torture things somewhere else, because it is our island, uh, for, uh, out of a Cuban perspective, and we don't want you there. So, I don't understand this, but of course I also don't understand how, why, how you can torture people. But I'm not sure what he, let's let him finish. Forward situation with Guantanamo Bay, which is located in Cuba, it's kind of like this. I am the first president of Cuba. Now that we are independent from the US, I will offer you a perpetual lease to Guantanamo Bay. Awesome. We'll pay you guys every year. We are the new Cuba. We don't want you. Get out. Hey, your old president agreed a perpetual lease to us until both countries agree or we abandon the property. We don't want to do that. We're going to stay here. Well, uh, yeah, revolution. We don't recognize that treaty. Well, we do. Here's your lease check for the year. Thanks for doing business. I'll shake myself. We'll see you next year. Okay? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. At one. Mm. So the Cuban, Cuban ones don't, don't, don't want them to be there, but uh, they are not powerful enough to just um, throw them out. And it may be also not worse to go to war about this, I'm uh, of a Cuban perspective. But still, they could go to the United Nations and uh, I'm not sure if they maybe did this. So, I, I, um, I, when I would be a Cuban president, I would go to the United Nations and try to get the Americans out of my island. They can go to do the war crimes somewhere else. Or stop with the war crimes, this would be also an option. Point the USA took administrative control over Cuba after the Spanish American War, in addition to Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Of course, the Philippines and Cuba gained their own independence. And the US also used to control the Panama Canal Zone for about 70 years. It was like, all right, Panama, you're getting your independence from us. Woo, 
me gusta. But I agreed to let the Americans have sovereignty over the canal zone because, you know, they're, they're kind of building it. What the? I mean, uh, you want us to leave and take all of our money and you finish building it or? Uh, for now, no. But let's talk in 70 years. Okay, then. Yeah. In addition, after World War II, we took administrative control over many of the islands in the Pacific that Japan used to control. The three Micronesian island groups of Palau, the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia were labeled as U.S. Trust Territories until they gained independence in 1986. Today, they are the only countries that have the Compact of Free Association status, meaning the U.S. provides defense, financial assistance, and social services to the countries, whereas the citizens are allowed to move, live, and work in the U.S. and easily obtain citizenship if they desire, and in return, they allow the U.S. to have military bases. In any case, every section of the United States has a unique story on how it eventually became part of the country. It basically goes like this. For example, the USA started as 13 British colonies that pretty much operated everything east of the Mississippi River. At one point, everything up to what is now Minnesota was just called Virginia. In 1803, we obtained the Louisiana Purchase from France, which didn't even have a properly defined western border. It just kind of arbitrarily ended at the Rockies. This doubled the size of the country, and a bunch of Acadian French-speaking criminals from Canada suddenly became American. In 1819, we expanded to the Pacific for the first time and had a shared condominium with the British in Oregon Territory. Two years later, Florida was ceded to us from Spain in a treaty in which we said that we would cede any claims to Texas. Well, long story incredibly short, the Texans in Texas kind of fought Mexico and became their own country for 10 years and then decided to cede their country back to the USA. In 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the Mexican-American War and the Alta... Um, some of the... I've uh, already heard before, like so certain colonies or so, but um, most of the rest is new to me. The California area was ceded to the USA, and after some quick borderline readjustments and new states popping up, the continuous USA was complete. The Guano Islands Act started in the 1850s, got us to claim a bunch of random small islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Civil War split us up for about 10 years, but then we reunited. Meanwhile, Alaska was purchased by Russia. 1898, Hawaii was annexed from the Kingdom of Hawaii. One year later, after the Spanish-American War, a bunch of new islands joined, but only... I think uh, Hawaii should, um, I mean... I don't know how the people on Hawaii think about this, but I think it would be nice when Hawaii got independent again. Mm, I'm sure the people don't want this at the moment, so it will not happen probably, but it would be nice, I think. Um, and Alaska sh should also, I mean, it doesn't make much sense that it's part of the United States. Of course, I purchased it, and so it's alright, and so, but um, so far away from the home, uh, rest of the country, but uh, yeah. I mean, Guam, and so, yeah. Puerto Rico and Guam would stay as territories. One year later, Samoa was taken over under the Tripartite Convention. Later, only what is now American Samoa would vote to remain. And finally, in 1917, we bought the Virgin Islands from Denmark. Yeah, almost every American has played the Oregon Trail in school and has died of dysentery. Uh, um, I uh, heard of this game. Um, uh, a YouTuber, Drew Donil or so, I played it. Um, I watched it. Just want to give a huge thanks to Bright Trip for making that animation. You guys are awesome. Check out their websites. They got some cool stuff. Hey, <laughs> we tried to buy Greenland like three times and they kept saying no, but like, come on, Greenland. Come on. On that note, you can kind of tell the story behind places in the USA based off of the language the name comes from. For example, many places in the middle of the USA that used to be part of the Louisiana Purchase have French names like Lafayette, Des Moines, or Des Moines. Hell, the entirety of Louisiana was named after King Louis the 16th, 14th, whatever. We're not French anymore. Places that used to belong to Spain and later Mexico have Spanish names like Puerto Rico, San Diego, and yes, even the city I live in, Los Angeles, Los Angeles. Otherwise, many cities and half of all the states are named after Native American words and or anglicized versions of Native American words. Kentucky, Ohio, Oklahoma. The city of Chicago means wild onion in the Miami, Illinois tribe language. In any case, basically, our country was born out of revolution. Long story short, we were a colony of Great Britain, not the UK yet, but Great Britain, for about one 170 years until King George III came in and went back crazy. Or at least that's how we see it. You know, the Brits are more like, you ungrateful colonials. We declared independence in 1776, which by the way, thank you Morocco for being the first country in the world to recognize us as a nation in 1777. Hey, I beat them to it in 1776. Hey, you don't get to speak for me as a nation as a whole. You will recognize them when I say so. Okay, now you can recognize them. However, the fighting went on for seven more years until the Treaty of Paris was signed in which Britain officially recognized us as a nation. Meanwhile, Canada just up north was like, <laughs> now I'm daddy's favorite. But then like 80 years later, it was like, ugh. 
I'm still dad's favorite. In any case, with the exception of a few other political entities, up until then, most of the world had been ruled either by monarchs or some kind of singular figurehead with... Um, I think maybe um, the United States is right now, but Great Britain or the British Empire was a few hundred years ago. The kind of world power which um, in makes uses, uses its influence to... Um, to the advantage and um, commit some war crimes and other atrocities through this and there will be a next great power which will probably do the same thing unless at some point we maybe mm, reach um, another kind of um, social system um, communism for example but anyway let's continue half an hour Um, 10 minutes in. Okay. Huge authority that all administration pointed towards. The US founding fathers developed a system of mixing elements of English common law, enlightenment philosophy, classic republicanism from ancient Greece and Rome, federalism, and separation of power. Basically, because we were so traumatized by the monarchical rule, we wanted to make a country ruled by a system that would make it really hard for the government to have too much power. In addition, we decided to become a um, I think this word, this um, really not was successful so much, because the government has now very much power, and um, yeah, but yeah, let's see. A federation, as in states share a singular sovereignty and must abide by the same federal constitution and the rights that it gives, like freedom of speech and press. But aside from that, they have the right to operate autonomously based on whatever regional values that each state holds and votes on. This is why sometimes people have to cross state lines to do things that might otherwise be illegal in the states they live in. Important to note, not everything was perfect in the beginning legislatively. Of course, we still had a long way to go and many things to fix. For example, slavery was still practiced and it did have legal provisions, women were not able to vote, and so on. But for what it's worth, the USA was the first nation state founded on enlightened principles of unalienable natural rights, consent of the governed, and liberal democracy. So yeah. America! In any case, history is boring. Let's look at some pretty pictures and whatnot. Let's discuss the famous places of the United States, and I will do it! Now, we all know about the most publicized landmarks, like the Statue of Liberty, Las Vegas, the Empire State Building, Times Square. Las Vegas is uh, very interesting because I heard that the uh, water supply for Las Vegas is um, done in a way that um, where all the water which was used, um, used gets um, can be used again through filter um, um, stuff and so uh, very um, efficient in the in, in the way it uses its water Las Vegas. Um, I heard this. I'm not sure how true it is, but. I saw it also in the video, which is very interesting. So you could, um, if then if then the the process of ma making the water clean again and um, usable again is also done through um, energy ray energy sources like um, the sun, solar energy, or other energies. You could maybe just uh, run the water without um, worrying to waste water or um, waste energy because um, yeah. I'm not sure how it, how it is really, but uh, I heard this and it's very interesting. The Golden Gate Bridge. Um, I mean, they um, need to do this. I need to be very efficient with water because Las Vegas is, I think, um, located in this uh, desert in Nevada, which is um, not very um, nice to live in. Bridge, Mount Rushmore, Grand Canyon, Lincoln Memorial, Niagara Falls, the Hollywood sign, Gateway Arch, and Disney World, the largest amusement park in the world. We have 130 national monuments and 24 UNESCO heritage sites. Yeah, 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 we get it. But let's talk about some of the more underrated places that are just as equally as fascinating as their over-publicized counterparts. Instead of New York, try Chicago. Instead of the Statue of Liberty, maybe check out the Birth of the New World or the Dignity Statue in South Dakota. Instead of Mount Rushmore, try the Crazy Horse Monument. Instead of the Grand Canyon, try Arches National. National Park, Vermilion Cliffs, Devil's Towers, and my favorite spot, Monument Valley. Instead of Disney World, try Six Flags Magic Mountain. Instead of the Golden Gate Bridge, try the Chesapeake Bay or Sunshine Skyway or the Mackinac Bridges or the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway in Louisiana, the longest continuous bridge in the world. For history, yes, we have history. I'm talking about ancient pre-colonial. Go to the Cahokia Mounds, Poverty Point Earthworks, Hoven Weep, Tonto, Chimney Rock, Navajo National Monument or the Pueblos of Mesa Verde, Taos or the Chaco Culture National Historical Park. 
Park, Aztec Ruins, Petroglyph National Monument, Montezuma Castle, so many things. We have the tallest trees and the tallest tree in the world, the Sailing Stones of Death Valley. In Hawaii, you can literally see active lava spewing rocks, or the world's largest protected marine area at Papahanao Mokuakea. Also, they have the Polynesian Culture Center, and one of our best kept secrets, White Sands National Park that looks like you're walking on the moon. Go to the underrated states like West Virginia, they have River Gorge, North Dakota has the strange enchanted highway. The New England states have the best autumn trees. Oregon has the ghost forest. Wisconsin has so many weird whimsical attractions. My favorite one being the house on the rock. Idaho, Montana, Eastern California, Nevada, and Alaska have some of the best preserved Western style ghost towns. Freaking Alaska, ice caves, fjords, tundras, probably. I love to see, yeah. I love to see, and it looks very beautiful. Probably some of the best nature in the entire country. American Samoa and Guam and the Marianas are a wonderful place to see Micronesian and Polynesian culture displays. The Virgin Islands are like the wedding honeymoon capital of our country. God, there's so much and that's not even the beginning. This is one of the reasons why like only 56% of Americans own passports. Because we kind of have a lot to see in our own backyard. And it's no wonder considering that our backyard is one of the most biodiverse in the world. Let's discuss more of that in... <laughs> Now, to summarize every conceivable landscape you can think of, we have. The USA is regarded as one of the most geographically diverse nations on Earth, and with that landscape spectrum, you can find an infinite amount of natural wonders. But first, let's look at the map. So first, let's start with the lower 48. Generally speaking, there are seven main physical regions. The coastal plains extending from the North Atlantic states to the Gulf of Mexico, split off by the Appalachian Mountains. From there, you have the Central Plains and the Great Lakes region east of the Mississippi River, Lake Superior being the largest lake and the largest freshwater lake by surface area in the world, third largest by volume. However, only about 45% of it belongs to the U.S., meaning the largest lake completely within the U.S. boundaries and largest lake by area in the world fully within a single country would actually be Lake Michigan. Altogether, these five lakes make up about one-fifth of the world's above-surface freshwater. West of the Mississippi, you have the Great Plains, the flattest part of the country, and home to Tornado Alley, where the strongest and most tornadoes form than anywhere else on Earth. From there, you reach the Rocky Mountains, the U.S.'s longest chain and third longest in the world after the Andes and the Great Escarpment in South Africa. The Rockies are also the source of the longest river in the United States, not the famous Mississippi, which begins in Minnesota, but by one one mile extra, the Missouri River actually beats them at 3,341 miles. Past the Rockies is the Great Basin, which holds the U.S.'s desert ecoregions, eight cold deserts with alpine flora, and three dry, hot, shrubland, rocky, sandy deserts. Fun fact, the Sonoran Desert shared with Mexico is the only place in the world where you can find the famous saguaro cacti. You've probably seen them in movies and TV shows. They grow here naturally. From there, the other side of the Great Basin is bordered by the coastal ranges, a.k.a. the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada. Keep in mind, this range also sits on the San Andreas transform fault line, which is part of the larger Ring of Fire. That means this area is the most earthquake-prone region in the country, with lots of geothermal activity, such as the eruption of Mount St. Helens in the 80s. From there, the state of Alaska up north actually has the highest peak, Denali, as well as all of the top 10 highest peaks in the country as well. Otherwise, unlike the islands formed by the Ring of Fire, the Hawaiian Islands were not formed by a fault line or rift system, but rather by their own unusual isolated hotspot, where magma spurred out on its own through plumes, in the middle of the ocean. This is also known as the Emperor Hawaiian Seamount Chain, and technically, if you consider height from the base of the mountain to the peak, Mauna Kea on Hawaii's Big Island could be seen as the tallest mountain in the world, as over 25,000 feet or 75% of its total elevation goes underwater to the seafloor. Yeah, what the Midwest lacks in landscape, they make up for in skyscape. We have the craziest atmospheric conditions in the Great Plains. People from all over the world come to our country just to see tornadoes. It's a thing, tornado tourism. Oh, and fun fact, many homes, schools, and businesses in the Midwest and Great Plains have tornado shelters and cellars. And in schools, the kids also practice tornado drills. I had to do that as a kid. And in that regard, some students in the West Coast have to do like earthquake drills. We know how to handle natural disasters here. We're pretty good at it. In the USA, life is like a constant economic game of opportunistic chess moves mixed with skill and luck. We know our potential and we want more. That's why we never stop moving. We hate me mediocre, mundane complacency. You could win it all or you could mess up and lose it all. But the point is, you could. We go crazy over that word. Not every country in the world offers a could to their people. We aren't really afraid of failure or embarrassment. That stuff passes away easily. Hell, we even capitalize and make money off of our embarrassment. Have you seen our reality shows? But the one thing we are terrified of is regret. And that's the core of the American spirit. An American doesn't wonder. We dream. Whether it's plausible or deluded and foolish, we dream. Anyway, that was kind of a... Is this a nice saying? Um...
It was the American dream, it says you must be asleep to believe it. It was not from, it's Eden invented this saying. So, um, if you um, uh, think that's offending, um, don't complain about me. Um, I'll just repeat what I heard. Ramble, not gonna get too far into it. In any case, it's time for my triple shot espresso break. Let's bring Noah in to fill in for the rest of the segment, shall we? The fire may be gone, but the heat still lingers. Straight from the Great Plains, Cyclone Country, the state of Iowa. It is I, Noah. So let's get into some statistics first, shall we? It is already well known that today the USA has the largest economy by nominal GDP out of any nation and the second largest purchasing power parity after China. The dollar is the most widely used currency in international transactions and is the world's reserve currency. Used by many other countries as an official and de facto currency, we are the world's largest importer and second largest exporter after China. Out of the world's 500 largest companies, over 120 are headquartered in the USA. We alone have about 40% of the world's billionaires and 30% of the world's millionaires. The NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange are the largest stock exchanges in the world by market capitalization and trade volume. Some of our most profitable exports include petroleum products. By the way, um, I think in the next 25 years or t um, 15 years, I'm not exactly sure, um, China will overtake the United States with the GDP. I don't care so much about the GDP. It doesn't um, say so much about the economy. It only um, says that how much money is um, earned and um, in this country or put or values are produced as products um, are produced in this country with this value, but uh, it doesn't um, say anything about the conditions of um, the pe the people uh, who made this um, product. But um, I think still um, in two thousand twenty five, two thousand thirty. Something like this. Um, it's predicted at least that China will have the larger um, economy. Electronics, machinery, aerospace, and defense equipment, and civilian passenger vehicles, and medical and scientific equipment. We have the top most profitable companies and the largest commercial brands on earth that are world renowned, such as Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Tesla. We even invented the concept of venture capital. It's not enough for us Americans to just profit, we have to potentially profit. Our franchises have become widely globalized. In some of the most remote places on earth, you can find either a McDonald's or a KFC. And even the countries that either hate or restrict opening up an American franchise will often rip them off and capitalize off the idea. Whether or not an international lawsuit ensues or not is another question. The point is they know the idea works. In addition to entrepreneurship, innovation, creativity, and invention has been a deep-rooted part of our history. We were even the first country to have an electronic grid provided to citizens as a utility in 1882. The Wright brothers invented the first sustained and controlled airplane in 1903, which pioneered and revolutionized the air travel industry. We love getting the world involved in our commerce. This is in large part thanks to our free marketing capitalistic economic model in which market is run by hey, note these are not originally american ideas that's true um capitalism i can think i came from italy but the americans um, the united states americans mastered it to a degree where um where it's right now where some people are very rich and many 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 are very 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 poor the consumers. And basically, thanks to our loose marketing laws, almost anything from the realm of public decency can be advertised. We go so far as advertise things like medicines, colleges, and yes, even the famous attorney settlement claim billboards and cheesy commercials are an American staple. Did you get hit by a car? Did you get mesotheliomia? Or did you get shot by a bear with mesotheliomia? Well, call right now because you might be entitled to financial compensation. You gotta love those commercials. In any case, some people like to vacation in our nature zones, like our favorite animal correspondent. You know what? This time I believe it's just Caleb, take it away. Hey guys, so you know, I've been Geary Harlow on this channel for a while, but as we reach the home country, it's time to be real. And this is the real me. <laughs> it actually is. <laughs> you couldn't tell before because I was wearing a hat in a disguise. <laughs> Just like Noah, also hailing from the great state of Iowa. It is I, the American, Caleb Seaton. 
So, the USA is classified as one of the top 10 mega diverse nations on Earth. Over 600 species of reptiles and amphibians, more than 800 species of birds, over 430 species of mammals. The largest mammal within our country being the North American bison. Today, we have 63 national parks, 13 of which are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, including the world's first national park and probably our most famous one, Yellowstone. The swampy parts of the Deep South is the reptile haven. You have alligators and turtles lurking everywhere. There are even crossing signs with gators on them. In the Rockies, we have black and brown bears, bobcats, and mountain lions. Remember that time we saw a bear in, what was it? The oh Mammoth my Lake. gosh, let me tell you this story. <laughs> so Paul and I went on a camping trip up near Mammoth, California. One of the stupidest things we've ever done because we, <laughs> we were like just warming up around the fire and I look behind Paul. It's a freaking bear like 15 feet away from you. We found a bear. Are you kidding me? That's a, that's a freaking bear. We almost uh, died. In the Alaskan North, you can find grizzlies and polar bears, as well as narwhals and walruses. In the deserts, we have coyotes, javelinas, desert tortoises, and tarantulas. All along the West Coast, you have harbor and elephant seals, giant Humboldt squids, porpoises, dolphins, and whales. Our tropical islands are home to some of the most amazing endemic bird and fish species, such as the Hawaiian honey creeper and the nene, and the state fish, the humuhumu nuku nuku apua'a. Did it. I do that right? Got it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and that, of course, brings us to our national animal, the bald eagle. Majestic, powerful, and swift. This eagle is found usually by large bodies of water as they prefer fish. They build the largest nests out of any bird on earth. And yes, it is true, all American citizens, whether born or naturalized, are able to summon one at their will in times of emergency. I should salute it. And speaking of emergencies, I have to get back to my wife Jillian because I just had a second baby. Say hi to Eden Ray. She enjoys making bubbles out of her mouth. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Caleb. Actually, fun fact, the whole reason I got involved with Geography Now originally was because I met Barb's at Caleb's wedding. And it's been great since then. Woo! How about that? Enough on that. Let's discuss the food. First, let's start off with the American classic breakfast. You've seen it. Pancakes, baked. Sausages and some eggs. Do you can say okay? Chicken sausages, eggs, and don't forget those hash browns. However, most Americans will eat another iconic American invention, cereal. That's right, we invented the fastest breakfast on earth. You just add milk and done. Otherwise, we have some very iconic regional cuisines. For one, let's bring it to the Native American side. Such dishes that are shared amongst numerous tribes in the lower 48 include things like fry bread, bison jerky, three sisters stew, wojapi, pemmican, wild rice. Whereas for the Inuits up north, you might find whale blubber slash meat, caribou slash reindeer meat and sausage, Cloudberry or salmonberry jams, smoked Alaskan salmon, king crab legs, and a gudak, their dessert. Whereas on the islands like Hawaii and Samoa, you'll find many dishes baked in their own versions of the earth oven. Poi or mashed purple taro paste and kakui nut meat is the staple in many dishes. They specialize in numerous garnished seafood dishes like ahi ahi and Pacific. And we are just 25 minutes in, so a bit less than the half, and I have already 42 minutes. I think that's good. So. Um, as long as I have always, um, I'm not sure how long the video will be. Maybe two hours. Or just two, one and a half, I'm not sure. Let's see. Lobster. And the immigrants, like the Filipinos, Portuguese, and Japanese, even have incorporated their own fusion to modern day Hawaiian cuisine in things like loco moco, stem musubi, and poke bowls. Then we get to soul food, which you've probably heard of fried chicken and waffles, fried okra, macaroni and cheese, collard greens, ham hocks. And speaking of the South, our best kept secret Cajun food. Imagine, if you will, if French cuisine was forced to use ingredients from the swamp and it actually worked. But almost every American grocery store has some kind of Cajun or Creole seasoning. My favorite, Chef Gone Mad. Things like gumbo. Jambalaya, crawfish boil, pralines, boudin, beignets, alligator, and andouille sausage. New England has their own cuisine as well. Things like lobster rolls, lobster bisque, clam chowder, and you can't forget Maryland blue crab and crab cakes. They also have Tex-Mex cuisine, which typically has heavier ingredients and uses more flour tortillas instead of corn. Enchiladas, fajitas, quesadillas, and also we have so many different regional barbecue style. And Barb's favorite, Kansas City style ribs. Love it, so good. So many places have their own style. Of the pizza of the American content is um, interesting. I've never seen something like this before, but uh, yeah, interesting. 
pizzas and hot dogs. The biggest competitors are Chicago Deep Dish and New York Thin Crust. Americans are also known for their sweet pies, most notably apple pie, banana cream, lemon meringue, key lime pie, pecan pie. And speaking of pies, one of our favorites is pumpkin served on Thanksgiving. And finally, our most iconic national dish, the burger, which has so many regional specialties, America would be nothing without the burger. Well, that- I mean, um, if for example, a certain state of the United States would um, uh, abandon, uh, I think maybe some already did, the death penalty, and also have a uh, more peaceful police, maybe I would then visit the United States, or the certain states. I'm not sure. Tell me some things, sound interesting, but um, the disadvantages uh, are the ones still lots, uh, way higher than the advantages. That's it for me, and until we meet again, stay tuned and stay ready. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. Quick side note in regards to the food stuff. Yes, we have a tipping culture at sit-down restaurants, not fast food chains. Typically, rates are 15 to 20%, and it's not that hard to calculate. You just take the price that you owe, move the decimal place one spot, and then divide that by two, and then add that half to the move decimal number that you originally priced yourself. Yeah, but it's still um, weird. I mean... Of course, too, some, some people also dip in Europe, and maybe it's also in some places um, required, but um, and in other places it's also um, seen as uh, um, um, it's offending, in, uh, I think, other parts of um, Europe. But here in Germany, I mean, I am not, not so often in restaurants, so <laughs> I don't know so much, but I think it's also not common here in Germany. But it's it sounds weird and it's um it's something where um they should have the higher salaries and uh, dipping should not be necessary for the people. So if if you can exploit them and if you rely on people to dip, um why should the people give them higher salaries? The like the owners of the restaurant. If they um, already um, have enough money through the dipping, yeah, that's that's a problem. It's also the problem with getting rid of such a habit. Because um, companies or, or restaurants also don't see the need to pay their people better because the dipping culture that you owe simple and yes we eat while walking like i said we value our time we want things now and see that's america every ethnic group has a story on how they got here and everyone has their own thing yet at the end of the day we're all on the same journey of figuring out how we ended up sitting in our cars eating taco bell in a walmart parking lot contemplating life choices at 3 a.m we've all been there anyway that's a charming way to introduce my people walmart walmart um but as there was once i think also walmart uh in in germany but uh, they uh, stopped operating here again because the labor laws uh, were not to their favor. Which I think is, is, is funny. Full to the world. Let's jump into the demographics. I think all Americans, they all want the same thing. Live a good life. They just want different versions of that. It's a constant wild chase and a hunt for the next big thing. We may all come from different backgrounds, but we've got each other's backs. That and we can all go to McDonald's at 5 a.m. Opinionated and maybe a little crazy, but in a good way. Bald eagles flying through the air, although those majority live in Canada now. <laughs> Cuyo es pasión saber que de un 100 por 35 salen cosas muy grandes. Americans are the only people on earth who will wear sunglasses after the sun is set. So watch it. You gotta, you gotta watch Top Gun. Mavericks. It's all about the Mavericks, bro. Where we love adventure. We love unpredictability as Americans. Because the craziest stories come out of the United States of America. Whether it be a woman who... I'm not sure about this. There's some other crazy um, part of the world as well. I have heard crazy stories from many other places. Who got bit in the hand by a bear for punching it? The generations of fa families that like the same team. Manao wa o ke kanaka wa ihe kanaka oivi a kupa o ke aina me ke ano lavena lua ole ma ke honua apuni piha me ke aloha kaha ha ha kau i. And of course the Hawaiian flag, I like very much. I like with the alone with the because of the Union Jacks in the corner. It's so funny that they still have this. I mean, I like it. I like it very much. 
Knowing that you are a mixture of a plethora of stories, histories, and cultures. A flirty is someone who thinks an alligator is adorable um, and makes questionable decisions during a hurricane. There's the ideal and then there's the reality. Here in Washington, D.C., we don't even have full representation of Congress. We don't even have senators. Not all of us talk in a country accent. The irony and like, how did we all get here? I ponder that a lot. Nous avons travaillé en deux, joué en deux, et tellement les bons manger. Ah, et tout cas, les ailes les bons à rouler. Being able to just go drive in any direction. One of the most American things is going on a road trip. And driving for hours without a second thought. What it means to be an Alaskan is to live wild and explore. It's being able to sleep when it's light 24 out, be awake when it's dark out. Gotta love that midnight sun. I believe... Maybe it's a very, it's really as I understand it, or as, as the people I referred to far, um, told me, and um, this is freedom thing. So you you want to have the freedom to freedom to do whatever you want, whether it's now hurting you or hurting others, mm, as long as you are free. I'm not sure. Um, you can tell me also in the comments um, if you're from the United States how you see this, what you think Ameri an American is. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter so much. America, the United States of America is a country, and that's it. I, I, I don't understand this, how you know, identify with the country. I, would, I, don't, I wouldn't know how I would identify with Germany. I live here, that's all. Um, if I would live um, somewhere else, I would be maybe uh, British or Danish or Polish, but it wouldn't change the person I am. So, um, I don't uh, see, um, I don't, I, it's the same way. If there would be a war in my country, I would definitely have not fight for my country. Never. I, I wouldn't, and I will also never fight for my country. I will not risk my life for my country. I don't care so much about, about my country. I, I don't love my country. That's why I don't understand patriotism, where people, um, or nationalism, where people um, love their own country so much that they would to go, go to war for it. I think they are realists. <laughs> um... Yeah, but anyway, let's um, let's continue. Believe an American is someone who embraces diversity and use it to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. So for me, an American is someone who values and respects American ideals and freedoms. But the land of the free, the home of the brave, honestly. But America is nothing without New York. It's all happening here. Absurdly stubborn in your beliefs. At the end of the day, you're still gonna all be friends. You're gonna go out and get drinks with each other. We are the masters of making fun of each other. Being hungry, like after midnight, IHOP and Denny's are always there for you. For me, it's the house of waffles. It isn't just a waffle house, it's a waffle home. The battle rapper Jeff for calling football, soccer. This is America! I don't understand um, why people um, identify with any country. Whether you know come from France, um, China, uh, Australia, or Canada, or Argentina, or whatever else. Um, it doesn't change you. So I don't understand why people from um, love their own country in this way. Or, I mean, I don't understand it also with Germans, or with French, or with other people from other co countries in the world. I don't get it. I will mean, I also never get it, I think. An American to me is someone who likes to have a good time and someone that likes free refills. It's someone that likes very large portions at restaurants. You can use your EBT card at fast food places and wear sweats pretty much anywhere you are. An American, you can be anything. And can turn any conversation into a competition. There's no monolithic viewpoint or perspective on what makes an American American. Really, you get the whole melting pot. That's what America is. But that's what every country is. Every country is a, a very large mixture of everything. So what is an American? This is a question I've pondered about for a long time when I was writing this script. From a young age, we are taught the value of individualism. You are special. You are unique. There is no one like you in the world. And in that regard, we are also taught that it's good that we're different because then everyone has something unique and special to add. If we were all the same, then there wouldn't really be much to add or learn or grow from. It's the diversity that empowers us. We look at the world around us and see that they already know our songs and watch our TV shows and movies. Oftentimes, they imitate things that we started and put their 
own spin on it. We also regularly notice that on the news, people from all over the world fight to immigrate here. They seek refuge and asylum. It seems like they really want to join this country badly. So in a sense... I, I doubt this. I mean, if you come from a very developed country, like in Europe, I don't see why any European people would uh, want to live in America, in the United States of America. Because the most things they have there, they can also have here, plus additionally some things like, for example, free healthcare and um, better transportation system. Just for example. Um, but the same with freedom of speech and other things they could uh, have also here. Present now in, in Spain, France, and um, Portugal, um, Norway, or Germany, maybe also. Um, from countries like in, in South America, poorer countries, I see why people maybe want to live in the United States because they see ha having just a tiny bit is better than having nothing. Especially, of course, countries in the United States um, fought wars in. But for the, for example, also Japan. I don't see many people from Japan uh, or poor people, especially <laughs> because most people in the world are poor or not rich. And um, at least I don't see anyone who is not rich and um, uh, and wants to travel there when he is not in a desperate um, need. So I don't um agree, I don't see this. And taking all of that into account, not trying to sound boastful, but because of that, being an American citizen is kind of like, it sometimes feels like being part of some kind of weird elite club that a bunch of people want to join or at the very least give attention to. And we love attention. It's practically our currency. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. The moment you give us your eye. Yeah, and maybe, maybe that's the problem and um, the case. Maybe he's right about this. Eyes and ears, we win. It feeds us. There's nothing we hate more than just being part of the crowd. Every American wants to find something about themselves that makes them stick out. This is why we obsess so much about things like labels and race. It's one of the easiest ways to forge an identity. We take DNA tests because at the end of the day, we all know that unless we're indigenous, we aren't native to this continent. We all come from somewhere else and sometimes we're curious. We want to know who we are. Doesn't everybody? This may sound kind of shallow on the surface, but you kind of have to understand, like all the nations of the Americas, we're kind of like the lost children of the world. We never came from royal. I mean, um, I don't understand. Also, I never understood why he ma ma made mention this so often in epi any, every episode the ethnicity of the people. I don't understand this. Why? It doesn't matter. <laughs> what? what why, why should I want to know um, where I come from? I, I know what I want to reach in life, more or less. But why, what, what, why should I want to know? Um, where my ancestors came from. There are no ability, no ancient legacies to honor. So in a way, we don't really have much to lose. We have to build our own empires. Of course, every American has a different story and not everyone will agree to this very sentiment, but at the very base, that's kind of what I guess it kind of somewhat feels like to be American. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that was a speech. In any case, let's talk about the ethnic makeup of the USA, shall we? Motion graphic time! First of all, the United States has about 340 million people and is the third most populous nation on Earth after China and India, and has the highest immigration out of any country in the world, and every nation on Earth has some kind of community or diaspora represented within it. The first and country's largest demographic being the white non-Hispanic group at about 60%, which mostly contains Caucasian Americans, typically with European origins. From there, the second largest community are Hispanic and Latino Americans, making up about 19% of the population. Keep in mind, the Latino and Hispanic communities are also incredibly diverse within themselves, and some may or may not also identify with either white or black communities, depending on where they feel on the racial scale. From there, the black community makes up the third largest demographic at somewhere around 13% of the population. After that, Asians and Pacific Islanders make up about 7% of the population, the largest communities being Chinese, Filipinos, Indians, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Japanese. And the remaining 1% is mostly made up of Native American or Hawaiian slash Alaskan. Alaskan natives. Also, keep in mind some of these people listed here also register under two or more races or some other race. So in that regard, I, mean, I wonder what would be a question when you someone would ask me, "What is your ethnicity?" I would not know how to answer, and I would maybe just leave this um, field empty before blank because I don't care and I don't know what I would be. So um, maybe this fixation on um, demographics and ethnicities um, is also Maybe a problem, I'm not sure, or just at least something typical for the United States.
regard, all these lines could be blurred and have asterisks applied to them, depending on what the individual claims on their document. We use the US dollar as our currency. We use the types A and B plug outlets and we drive on the right side of the road. And just like we explained in the UK episode, the USA is one of the few countries that does not use the metric system. Our units of measurements are miles, feet, inches, acres, Fahrenheit, pounds, tons, ounces, pints, quarts, and our favorite unit of measurement, the big fat gallon this is a gallon we actually measure our gas in these units too so yeah also keep in mind sometimes we don't even care we'll just make up our own units of measurement when we're too lazy we literally measure things like fried chicken and popcorn in buckets and ice cream in tubs now going back to the ethnic makeup thing it's important to know <laughs> that's funny that's, that's just funny half hour one hour I'll be party <laughs> I'm, I'm, I look forward to, um, I will on the weekend upload this video, probably um, after Friday, after midnight, so in the earliest hours of um, Saturday, like 1am or 0.30, I'm not sure. <laughs> Note that most multi-generational Americans today have a degree of racial and genetic admixture. Most white Americans today are descendants of immigrants that arrived through Ellis Island, not British colonials. Coming from countries like Germany, Ireland, Italy, and over time many of the whites kind of just mixed and created new American whites. It's not uncommon for them to have some Native American blood as well. And then it gets a little weird because some people are like, oh yeah, my great grandma was 184th Cherokee. No, I'm special. And the mm moment let's continue the same even applies to our black population according to a study published in the american journal of human genetics the average black person in the usa has about 24 percent european ancestry but it varies by the individual we'll talk more about the racial story of the usa in a bit but first language technically the u.s has never declared an official language however the de facto national language and language of use for all administration and documents is english or at least american english 28 states have voted to make english the official state language of their state three states have de facto bilingual policies they are maine and louisiana Louisiana for French and New Mexico for Spanish and oh my goodness Cajun French sounds so cool it's like lazy swamp French ah bonsoir mon chéri essayez du gombo et laissez le bon temps rouler <laughs> <laughs> As for Hawaiian, well, actually, I figured maybe we should let a real Hawaiian explain. Take it away, Mr. Kamaka. Did you know that Hawaii is the only official state where English and Hawaiian serves as co-equal languages in the administration? Sometimes you can even hear Hawaiian being spoken in legislature meetings. Since the 80s, there's been a huge Hawaiian language revival because of the creation of Hawaiian Immersion Schools. We have schools for preschool all the way to 12th graders, and everything is done in Hawaiian. About half a century ago, Hawaiian language was at the brink of extinction with only 2,000 native speakers. Today, in 2023, I'm proud to say there's over 30,000 people speaking our native tongue. Thank you, Kamaka. Follow him on his social medias and his website. He's an awesome guy doing great things for Hawaii. Otherwise, three of the territories also have official bilingual status along with English for their native languages, Spanish for Puerto Rico, Chamorro for Guam, and Samoan for American Samoa. And the Northern Mariana Islands is the only officially trilingual entity with Chamorro and Carolinian as the official languages alongside with English. However, as a whole, bilingualism has been growing fast in the US, mostly with Spanish and French as our most commonly taught languages in schools. In the 80s, our populace was only about 11% bilingual. Today, however, that number has more than doubled as the Census Bureau estimates that somewhere around one in five people in the US ages five and up uses another language at home, and one in four Americans are proficient enough to converse in another language. In any case, religion. In the USA, regardless of level of devotion, somewhere around 70, maybe upwards to 75% claim to be affiliated with some kind of Christian denomination, the largest ones being Protestant, followed by Catholic and non-denominational. Otherwise, the next largest religious groups are Jews and Buddhists at somewhere around 2% each and then Muslims at around 1%. For the rest of the country, it's kind of like a complicated topic because they tend to fall into a more agnostic approach in which they might claim to be spiritual but not religious. So going back to the topic, how did all the races end up here? Well, to start off, of course, the originals were the Native Americans. In a nutshell, they come from numerous tribes that each have their own customs and traditions. There are over 500. Um, actually, I think um, the real Native Americans are kind of Asian descent because at some point, um, they came from the Asian mainland, um, when I understand this correctly, um, over um, the Bering Street, which was at this point um, land. So, um, kind of, um, as American, just um, Americans, just uh, descendants from Asia. 
And we are all our descendants from Africa in a certain degree. So, <laughs> so to say this. 70 recognized ones. The Native American story of this country is an acknowledged sad one riddled in government mandated relocations, mass killings such as the one at the Battle of Wounded Knee, and broken treaties all over the place. In regard to that though, there's also a beautiful side to their story with pride and courage and tribes like the Navajo and Hopi that were honored for their code talker program in World War II. And today, some tribes like the Cherokee and Osage are starting to revive their languages to more modern usage with things like teaching it in schools, putting their tribal scripts on street signs and businesses and windows and documents and so on. I've said this before, every American needs to visit a tribal reservation at least once and spend time learning about them. After that, whites from England started coming in from the late 1500s to the early 1600s, basically English colonialism. After that, the Atlantic slave trade from West Africa began with Portugal and eventually made its way to the United States, which is where most of our black population is derived from. A more contemporary term that some of them might use is ADOS or American descendant of slavery to distinguish themselves from blacks that immigrated from the Caribbean or Africa. Keep in mind, the United States only took in about 4% of the enslaved peoples from the Atlantic slave Slave trade. Most of them either went to Brazil or the Caribbean when it was under the British. Eventually the Civil War and Emancipation Proclamation happened. From there it was still a struggle with a tense time riddled with apartheid laws and customs. Even in the north where they fought against slavery there was still racism. There were Jim Crow laws, the bombing of Tulsa, the Rosewood incident, redlining. Finally in the 60s the Civil Rights Movement occurred. The 60s was kind of like the big moment. It is said that slavery and the treatment of Native Americans is the darkest chapter of American history, our biggest shame. We don't hide from it, we acknowledge it, we teach it in our schools. It's like what the Nazi thing is to Germany or the imperial thing is to Japan. For what it's worth, the story of America is one with so many chapters, but if you look at how the story unfolds over the centuries, there is a beauty to it. Our country could not be what it is with so many amazing individuals that have revolutionized not just our country, but made shockwaves throughout the whole world. Look, I'm not trying to speak on behalf of the black experience because I'm not black. I mean, I did that DNA test and it said North African, but I'm not claiming anything unless y'all approve. And if you do, I'll bring ribs and Henny to the cookout. Hey, hey, hey. But for what it's worth, if you must take anything away from this, I think most Americans will agree that the story of America is nothing without the story of the black population. In any case from there we move on to the other major communities. The Chinese were the first Asians to arrive as rail line workers in the mid 1800s. Filipinos started coming in after the colonial years. Then the Koreans and Vietnamese so the Korean War and the Vietnam War. For the Latino community it's interesting. Some isolated communities of Mexicans and Spanish people were already living in certain parts of the West after lands were acquired from the Mexican American War. However their populations weren't really high until large migration waves came in in the 20th century. From there Latin Americans from all over started building communities. Los Angeles has the largest Salvadoran and Guatemalan communities. Miami has Cubans, Venezuelans, Colombians. Puerto Ricans and Dominicans love New York for some reason, even though the climate is nothing like their perfect, beautiful tropical islands. I don't get that whole thing, but whatever, you guys do you. And of course, when there's Latinos, you'll always find Mexicans somehow in the mix. There's a lot of other groups and stories behind their origins of coming here, but we just don't have time. This video is already getting long enough. If you are from a community that I didn't mention, please feel free to write about it in the comments and teach us, but otherwise we have to move on. In any case, one thing you'll notice is that our country tries really, really hard to make sure every race has some kind of representation in media or retail. For example, major store chains that sell cosmetics usually have to provide a line that comes in all shades of the skin spectrum, and most of them will have what they sometimes call ethnic hair or text hair or coily hair sections. And fun fact, Art and I actually shop in this part of the store because uh, why Art? Murray's pomade. It's the only thing that seems to work on our hair because yeah. our hair's thick. We always use it. So yeah, we use this all the time. This is a true American classic. Yeah, not a sponsorship. We just, not a sponsorship. We just really like this stuff. Yeah. Although it could be a sponsorship. First non-black people to be a sponsor <laughs> by Murray's. Yeah, you could use a ginger. You would, oh, be, oh, yeah. you would be considered the face of diversity for I them. Since the 70s, most of our TV shows and cartoons have had unspoken <laughs> diversity quotas in which every cast will usually have some minority character, either main, reoccurring, or guest character. Our toy sections at stores usually contain dolls and action figures that come in all races. Nothing more iconic to this sentiment than the famous collectible American Girl dolls. Then you have the really obvious attempts like Captain Planet, Magic School Bus, and that puppet show that tried too hard. Look, even if it comes off a little forced and pandering or cringy, we try our best and usually we mean well. In any case, that was such a long-winded explanation of American social dynamics. One person who also means well and is quite dynamic would be art so interesting um did i i just don't um there's a necessity uh so much for all of this ethnic stuff but um it, when it is um done in a way to represent everyone okay i mean let's switch up the subject and talk about the sports of the usa <laughs> i know it already um american football I think it's the highest, maybe base basketball as well. Ah! 
Ah, it is I, Artemis, hailing from the great state of Washington. So let's get started. For one, let's all go way back to the beginning. Tribes like the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and the tribe Creek played Chunky, which involved rolling a disc and throwing a spear. Some of the Algonquin tribes played some games similar to soccer called Pasakawa Kuhog, which could have had up to 500 people playing at the same time. And yes, since this is the USA episode, I'm gonna just call it soccer this time. Soccer. And the most famous one that survived Survives to this day. Yeah, football. I mean, I don't care so much, but yeah. Um, in in German, football. I don't even know how you. I mean, football is um, something you can translate very easily. You translate foot and ball, and then you have football. But soccer, I don't know how we would translate this to um, German. Um, and not calling it football. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is it doesn't matter really very much. Actually, the oldest organized lacrosse. This is interesting. This is very interesting. Mm. In um, uh, Trades of Cold Steel, there's the uh, lacrosse club, and I w was always wondering what's what is this? W what are they doing? And um, but it is a real sport. I didn't use this. I thought it would be just an invented sport for the game. But yeah, if you want to see um Alisa, I mean um the main character is Reen and Alisa is um the girl he in my opinion he always has to come together with. I even wrote some stories, you can also read them maybe I have also a link in the description. But again, if you want to see me playing this game, follow the link uh in the in the in the, in the description and play with me um the first game and later the second game, then the third and the fourth game. Sports in North America, lacrosse. Fast forward to today and numerous sports have been invented in our country. We love our sports so much that we even created a sport that cheers on other sports. It's called cheerleading. Ever heard of it? Oh, and one thing, almost all schools in the USA have a mascot, which is usually a costume character to help cheer on the team. And you know... Um, interesting, yeah. I've heard of cheerleaders, I mean, only in taps so far, but um, yeah. You had a real American experience if your school had to change its mascot due to outdated racist undertones. Oh yeah, my school did that. And then we get the big three. Baseball, basketball, and American football. Although some might say baseball... Hey, that's funny. American football is thing um, they call um, football. But there's, there's a wonderful short scene in this um, one video with from Nalf and... Radical Living. Hi guys, um, this is just a sh small uh, um, part of this video um, uh, when uh, people from the United States visit Germany um, there's a link to this video in the description as well it is from Vertical Living and uh, please um, watch the whole video if you are interested in funny comedy stuff but yeah, this is um, a small part of it and I just want to show it to you because football and uh, soccer all the shipping, you know. Hey, you wanna play some football? Oh, football? Heck yeah, I love football. Oh, I'll, be, I'll be right back. Where are you going? You're telling me you'd rather give your US dollars to Russia. Well, we don't pay in US dollars, but Euro or Ruble. You use the Ruble? Sometimes. I gotta make a call. All right, I am ready to rumble. Let's play some football. Why, why did you get the helmet? It's my football helmet. Plays football. Yes, Mr. President, sir. Yes, this is a code red. Code red, I repeat. They are buying oil from the Russians, but not in US dollars. They're using the ruble. Ruble, I tell you. We're playing football, foosball. With the, with the foot? Oh, I don't, I don't play that. I don't kick a ball with my foot. I play football. I tackle people. Americans, real sport. <sighs> So um, just to make this clear, I don't care so much about whether you call it now football or soccer, it doesn't really matter, but um, it would make more sense of course to call it football, because you played with the foot, and uh, maybe the handball would be more fitting to um, American football, what you call American football. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter so much um, how you call it, I'm not such a sport guy in any, in any way, so yeah. Just comedy stuff. Please watch the video. It's awesome. It's fantastic.
Um, there's a link in the description. Radical Living. Thank you very much. Great video. And yeah, we continue with the real video with uh, a reaction. Um, uh, I have maybe a link in the description or so, but. And you know, American fo uh, football, American fo football, with this um, helmet and this, all of this stuff, it's called football, but you play it with a hand. But uh, football, like the real football, what you guys call soccer, you call, you call, give it this weird name because, um, I mean, you play it with a foot, why should you call it football? And you call, of course, this thing football, the sport, which you play with your hand. But anyway, it doesn't matter how you name things, it's just funny. Paul was inspired by the game Rounders from England. The first official formalized version of baseball was created in New York City in 1845 and has become America's pastime sport. And basketball was created in Massachusetts. Uh, by a Canadian. Yeah, that's true. But if you wanted to make it a Canadian sport, he would have stayed in Canada. Oh, you Get the <laughs> We love you, Canada, though. <laughs> yeah, we love you. Anyway, people all over the world know our most famous player of all time, Michael Jordan, who is a multi- do I know him? I have, maybe I've heard of this name, but um, it's not such a big name that I would remember now. Ah, yeah, this guy. Hi, billionaire, and never has to worry about life ever again. <laughs> David, you wrote that. He's set for life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's become billionaires. <laughs> then we get to American football. We just call it football, sometimes called gridiron. It's our most popular sport. It was basically like a sport inspired from rules and techniques found in rugby and soccer, invented by Walter Camp in the 1870s and first played by four universities. Many outside the US and Canada might not quite get the sport. So if you have to summarize it, it's kind of like if you mix war and speed chess two teams 11 players they have to get to the end side okay let me just describe football really quick okay the chunky fat guys are the right paul the, the chunky the and linemen, fat the, the linemen, linemen on the front yeah. and the quarterback is trying to get the ball to whoever that can score a touchdown basically that's it. basically it and it is a big deal here like a really big deal the super bowl today the usa is the most successful nation at the olympics holding nearly 3,000 medals about 1200 of which are golds we even have the most decorated olympic athlete of all time, swimmer Michael Phelps. We have hosted the Olympics eight times, and soon the ninth is going to be here in Los Angeles in 2028. We will also. But this, but the next time, it will also um, uh, it will also be placed in Canada and in Mexico. I think so. It's not in the United States. I'm um, host hosted game, but in North America. Host the 2026 FIFA World Cup, and Los Angeles will be a host city as well. Otherwise, we have to bring up a bunch of other friends. Well, uh, FIFA was maybe um, a North American thing, and uh, and the uh, Olympics is only in the United States. But um, uh, I meant FIFA. FIFA is I think North America, Canada, United States, and Mexico. Sports such as running a reindeer and I did a rod in Alaska, monster truck rallies, freestyle motocross, and of course, one of our favorite American pastimes, entertainment wrestling. Things like WWF and WWE are staples of our American diet. There is nothing more American than WrestleMania. All the superstars and cheesy guest celebrities battle it out and destroy each other. Well, destroy each other. Do they really? I mean, come on. It's so real. It's, it's so real, it's right? So those are not actors, for sure. <laughs> and there are loads of independent, lower-tier entertainment wrestling leagues in which sometimes get, like, really weird with, like, a chicken fights a wizard or a pizza chef and a green goblin or a Pop-Tart and a mermaid. <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for me. I'm gonna get out of here. You know. Definitely weird. Um, but weird things are everywhere in the world. That's 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 nothing special for the United States. Um, it's it's 45 minutes in. Uh, 20 minutes still to go. So it will be a definitive. It's the longest video I ever made on the um on the Jacob Now episode, even longer than the UK episode, even if I don't speak now anything anymore. And I will probably pause again. You know, guys, I am so proud to be an American. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. You see him? I don't understand this. I mean, um, I don't understand this for any country in the world, not so specifically the United States, but also, of course. How can you be proud in your country? It's weird. I'm proud of myself. I'm proud maybe on the things I personally have have to have to she reached in my life. But 
Why should I be proud of my uh, country? The most things that my country do in the, the current government and in the past uh, I mean the, the most things that my country did in the past I'm not proud of I'm, I'm, I mean I have, I have not reached anything of them myself It's the good things um, of course not and the bad things also not luckily in this case but I don't uh, get it why you should be proud of your country mm. I, I think uh, theoretically countries shouldn't even exist in the world there should not be any borders in the world, like in the song of John Lennon, an American. But, yeah. Anyway. So, and I love you all. Thank you. Well, that was a great way to end it, man. Shut up, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Art. On that note, what is the easiest way to make friends with an American? Well, you have to master the art of the American interruption. Let me explain. In other countries, it's considered rude to listen on other people's conversations, let alone interrupt them while they're talking. But here in the USA, it's a social art form. In a way, unless we are quietly whispering something, we kind of don't mind if you hear us. And if you hear us talking about something you really understand well and you really feel like you can contribute something to the conversation, then you are allowed to subtly budge your way into the conversation. For example. Okay, do you remember that Scare Factor episode where they made him bungee jump and they almost hit the yeah, water? Yeah, I remember that. Did yeah, you yeah, see yeah, that yeah, one that's episode crazy. you're gonna eat the guy alive? That's crazy. Do you remember when they blended up the centipedes and it was yeah, like, oh, oh so god. god. For American best friend. Yeah, um, I, I heard that um, Americans are quite loud always. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm loud myself often, but mm, not in the same way. Uh, they're loud. Um, it, it looks more like screaming, at least in the moment, than just being um, loud in a casual way. But it also just a um, cultural difference. So it's um, it's just personal, maybe also. Keep in mind, this can go both ways for shared interests and shared hatreds. Yo, did you hear that new Blake album? No, he's not as good as he used to be. No, he, pre 2017 he Blake was ragged. Oh, like, no, he just be crying. Do you guys remember that that music video with the girl in like the orange dress? Like, what was yeah, she doing? What was that all about? For American best friends. And look, to my fellow Americans, I know some of you guys have been through some rough patches in the way how you see yourselves in our country. But let me just remind you a few things. Our country has gone through a lot of crazy things, a lot of shameful things in the past, but we also have a lot of glory and a lot of accomplishment. Hi, hello guys. Again, a small different video inside of this video. I hope that's okay. Um, also for Hassan Abi, um, I think it is. He um, is not the type of who make copyright claims or so. But I think this uh, part of his video here, um, U.S. admits to war crimes in Afghanistan, um, also shows very well that, um, of course, there were shameful things that the United States did in the past, like slave trade and um, so on. But uh, there are also shameful things that the United States do is doing right now, or until a few years ago, and also doing probably right now just in other countries. Who knows what they're doing, and we, we don't know about this right now. But, um, yeah, and it is not, I don't say that other countries don't do shameful things, also my country do shameful things, um, for example, United Kingdom and France, I think also supported the United States in the war against Iraq in 2003, so, also other countries do um, terrible things, um, also uh, China, Russia, um, Russia and um, Ukraine, China may be in the um, western region with a Muslim minority, and so it's not just a thing that the United States is doing um, terrible things. Other countries do, do things as well, which are terrible. But it's also important to not um, ignore this. And at this point, I just want to show this video or this part of this video. Maybe it's just five or six minutes long. I'm not sure how exactly how long exactly it will go. But I think it's important. If we want to um, improve ourselves, as um, a species, as um, mankind, then we have to acknowledge also um, all the things we um, do wrong and try to improve us. I will have also a link, of course, to his video, Hassan Abi's videos, in the description. Um, but yeah, let's take a look inside. Okay, a moment. Um, yeah. This is a, one of the very few instances over the course of the past. He is talking about, um, I think, the last drone strikes the Americans did in Afghanistan. Um, the video is over a year old, so maybe a year ago or so, before they left Afghanistan. Um, so, the context. 
there was a um, drone, sp drone strike. Um, I mean, there was also, I think, I'm not sure if this happened after this or before the drone strike, but there was also a, um, a terrorist attack on the Kabul airport. And from ISIS car, I think it's a um, ISIS um, part which uh, operates in Afghanistan. And um, the United States uh, thought that the person they killed through this drone strike was um, a part of ISIS car. It turned out it was wrong. It turned out it was a humanitarian aid worker and his entire family, which was killed in this. And Hassan Abi speaks about this. That's 20 fucking years where someone, an official, has actually taken accountability. In the overwhelming majority of cases, when the victims are Pakistani, when the victims are Afghan, America has never said anything. If anything, they've operated like Tesla. They'll like get you to shut the fuck up by giving you some hush money. These are voiceless people. These are powerless people. These are innocent people. All they want to do is survive. And they get caught up in our fucking madness because we're horny for war and we want to make money for our military contractors. It's absolutely disgusting. It is impossible to comprehend if you have been blinded by american imperialist uh you know jingoist ideology if you've been blinded by uh american exceptionalism it's so hard for you to understand the hatred that people feel against the terrorist state of the united states of america when we routinely engage in actions like this i understand it i really do we are a force for evil when kids in that fucking region have PTSD, they fear skies that are not cloudy because that means that drone strikes will occur. Like, we did that shit. It's so pure, pure fucking evil, dude. What a perfect encapsulation of American foreign policy. We went in just as we went out of that country in a blinding rage that, that caused us to do untold amounts of fucking cruelty to civilians that did not deserve it, that did not, that, that just were chosen by us to be our victims we turned around and we blew up a fucking family dude seven babies running into their humanitarian aid worker father's car as they do every single day when they celebrate him returning from fucking work we dropped the hellfire missile into that courtyard and we fucking murdered that entire family that's america that's the shit that never gets coverage too but if you're not from america and i and i talked about this in the interview that i did earlier today like if you're not from america and especially if you're from like turkey or a, a, a subsequent like regional uh, country and obviously like turkey is aligned with america but even if you're not from america you see that you understand the fucking pain you understand the the frustration that people have towards it in like super simplified reductive terms we are the playground bully you know that's why how we say like we are a racist ass nation we're a white supremacist nation that's why i showed you that fucking marshal that punched the, the the black dude in the face when he was handcuffed we do that here domestically and of course we do countless amounts of endless amounts of cruelty to others overseas responsible for more death destruction and violence than any other fucking contemporary nation and yes that includes china too i don't give a fuck part of the reason why the one belt one road initiative can be so successful for china is because numerous other countries are like of of course we will fucking work with China. Are you kidding? Um, and something I have to mention on this moment as well. Um, when he, he was talking about also police violence in the United States. And we have also police violence here in, in Germany. And also, I saw a video once on Twitter, I think. where I think it was in Berlin. Someone, um, a few police officers were beating up someone. Um, and the context doesn't matter. There were three or four of them holding him, holding him on the ground and beating him. So uh, that's also, of course, uh, terrible and similar to what very often happens in the United States. So we have the same problems here, maybe just not as extreme as in the United States. And also if you um, think, you know, mm, what happened in France recently with the Arab guy who was um, killed in the Paris suburbs. And... Yeah, so we have, to, we have also similar things here, not as often as in the United States, maybe, for example, police violence, but the similar problems exist here, and also racism and so, so we have to work um, against this, um, things against this um, violence all over the world together. And if we do this, we can maybe live at some point in a better world. Yeah, but let's continue this, um, I want to show you a bit more of this video. Me? At least they're not fucking, you know, drone striking us, bombing us, murdering us. Yet, who knows what they'll do? But for the time being, they aren't doing that. 
13 soldiers died and their pictures are blasted yeah, everywhere in news media. Thanks. Yeah, when those job. 13 soldiers died in the blast, 170, I think, right? Or 100 plus Afghan civilians died too. And some of them died because we right. shot them and we never even talked about it. Everybody was like, this is Biden's Benghazi, 13 soldiers, 13 soldiers died. Yeah. That sucks that we're sending fucking young men and women out there to do so much fucking violence. And then they ended up getting fucking blown up. Not a single mention of the Afghan civilians that died. And not from the explosion. From, from our bullets. Because in the fog of war, every brown person looks the same. It looks like they look like an enemy combatant. Our soldiers at the Kabul airport opened fire on a crowd of civilians that were trying to get away. And a crowd of civilians, women, and children. They murdered Afghan collaborators. They murdered Afghan soldiers that were working side by side with them because they thought, oh shit, it's, a, it's an attack. One of the Afghan translators that was trying to escape the country got shot in the back of the fucking neck by an American bullet. That's what he got for working with the American military. Shot in the back of the fucking neck. Hit with an American bullet in the chaos that ensued. That's all we're capable of doing. No coverage on that, with the exception of one BBC article, with one BBC reporter talking about it. No other coverage. Yeah, but it's for the greater good. Like what? What greater good? Y you think getting the world angry and want to fucking do 9-11s every goddamn day to the United States? That someone in the chat mentioned it's really doing this for the greater good is really um, hurting me always when I hear this. Um, there's no greater good in this. It's a good thing? Is that what you think? What do you think happens when your fucking family member dies after working with the U.S. forces in the middle of a fucking crowded street because American forces opened fire on him and murdered him? Greater good is killing fucking aid workers and their entire families? That's the greater good? What is good? There's not a single fucking thing that the United States has ever done that's good with respect to our imperialist endeavors. Not a single fucking thing. Dude, how fucked up is it? I mean, I talked about this earlier, that U.S. aid, okay, our aid is utilized to radicalize Mujahideen Islamist fundamentalists. Like, think about that for a second. Even when we're giving motherfuckers books, we're literally nefariously trying to get them to, to become a force for evil, dude. We've never done anything good, ever. U.S. aid is like literally an, a, a, an arm for the CIA. We put guns inside of fucking food crates so we can give it to murderous fascist militant groups, man. That's what USA does. You fucking kidding me? A force for good my ass, dude. Kurds in Iraq disagree. Kurds in Iraq disagree. That's fucking bullshit, dude. That's not even fucking true. Kurds in Iraq have are, are so desperate that they know full well that the United States is going to fucking withdraw aid and then allow Turkey to come in and just fucking roll over them. They know that and they still work with the United States because they have no other option. But ask any fucking Kurd in Iraq and they'll tell you like, yeah, of course, they fucking, they abandon us all the time. Yeah, Kurds in Iraq, what's up? Like, the northern autonomous region is like the one area. But outside of that, where's the fucking Kurdish nation state? US aid doesn't do any good is a silly, unserious position. Okay. Taking out Gaddafi was good? Bro, is this guy memeing? This is the same fucking guy that like got his butt cheeks clapped when he said 72,000. That's not true. Taking out Gaddafi was good? Really, dude? You think taking out Gaddafi was good? What's happening in fucking Libya now, dude? You think Libya is in a good place? I, I love open air slave markets. I love utilizing propaganda to make it seem like every fucking African migrant that lived in Libya is actually a, a terrorist so we can justify selling them. Like, literally selling them. I fucking love that, dude. Is that what you're saying? Things that are better than if Gaddafi had fought a civil war and slaughtered 200k in What? Gaddafi was gonna slaughter 200k in Benghazi? What the fuck are you talking about, dude? What kind of delusional fantasy universe are you living in? Who the fuck was Gaddafi fighting against, too? That he com completely had fucking under control. How dare we? have any sort of fucking take on like what other foreign nations can and can't do with respect to their own airspace operation desert storm massive success when i think about the highway of death an internationally recognized war crime where the united states literally had guns and they were like we got to use them somewhere so let's just use them on retreating fucking armless soldiers and refugee children and just bomb an entire fucking highway length Maybe of of guys. random fucking babies and 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 parents and retreat Reading men, I think of excellent, excellent uh, shit that we did. A defensive war on the behest of a government is just. You have never, you haven't given a single fucking example of a defensive war that's justifiable so far. Um, I would even say uh, no war is justifiable. It's always about, it's always only about uh, 
the benefit of some rich guys or some powerful guys, but never for the benefit of the ordinary simple people, because the only one who is really suffering in the war is the people, um, the, the simple people, the um, innocent people. But those in power, those rich guys, they will never um, uh, have any disadvantages in fighting wars. For example, also in Ukraine, of course, the people who are suffering are the people on the ground, the people whose um, land is destroyed, the farms, the villages, the, the cities, the everything. But uh, Putin and Zelensky are both on the winner, winning side because they will never get punished for this, for the, the crimes they commit. It's only about um, their benefits and the um, normal people who just want to live a peaceful life, they will suffer. Because on the one side, of course, they are killed in um, bomb bombing attacks, their ground is destroyed, their land, land is destroyed, and also um, the future is destroyed because um, because also of the um, destruction of the land, the, the the cities and everything, but yeah, at the end of the day, the normal people will suffer and the rich people will win. It's just disgusting, but um, that's why I, I always also say that the best thing a soldier can do is refuse to fight and um, demand his leaders to negotiate. Lay down your weapons, refuse to fight, refuse to kill anyone and it's the best thing you can do. Russian soldiers and Ukrainian soldiers is for both the same. They both for the same advice for me. I mean, from me, it's advice to both of them, and they should both do just um, refusing to fight, striking, kind of. But anyway. So you're wrong on that, okay? Libya is literally demonstrably uh, in a worse place now. Post Gaddafi. I know what he's going to say. He's going to say World War II. That's the only thing he can say. There's nothing else he can say. We're still riding the waves of World War II as we piggybacked off of the tremendous amount of fucking pain that the USSR uh, was able to take on. We're still piggybacking off of that. It's so tight. Yeah, defensive war is when you fucking uh, destroy Libya and every other country. Korean War was a just war. Yeah, dude, I love doing genocide in North Korea and destroying all matter of infrastructure. That's my, that's my uh, justifiable war is genocide in Korea was so justifiable. Do you guys got more, dude? Oh man, there's gotta be some more. There's gotta be some, right? I mean, fuck. I love bombing parts of Korea and, and uh, you know, engaging in genocide to a degree where like it took like 30, 40, 50 fucking years to recover. Vietnam, yeah, again, love doing genocide so good oh my god especially in southern vietnam which is so weird literally using chemical weapons that have such a devastating long-lasting effect that like there are still children that are being born with also i'm um, in laos i think where they dropped so thousands of thousands of missiles but um i i, I promise you um as soon as it goes on with the reaction i just want to show this because i think it's important i really like this video very much um and yeah please also subscribe to him and so if if you like it as well and if you think it's interesting or um yeah but yeah let's just finish it severe fucking disabilities dude that's what we did in vietnam go ahead oh my god there's got to be some more dude i love americans name a justifiable war that does not involve a uh, world war ii challenge it's just you can't like there is none literally just war it's literally just war theory 101 is there a view um, i think that's um, pretty much the most important part of it so i know it's long i know um you actually clicked on this video probably to see the reaction but it also goes on in a moment, but I think it was important to see this, so um, that's why I showed it to you. Um, every country has its um, bad sides, and every country do some war crimes. Or the most countries, the most powerful countries, commit their war crimes at some point. And it's terrible, and we have to do something against this um, all over the world. But yes, I will also give you some final thoughts um, a day later or a few days later after I reacted to this video and a day later after I started to edit the video um, after the whole video is finished. So, see you then again. Um, one, two, three. It's your country just as much as it is mine and you're my family and we get to share in the glory of this country. Elements on the periodic table were discovered or co-discovered by us and five of them are named after places in our country. Let's see, let's see. There's always the flag of the people who discovered it. 
Let's see. Um, there's a there's a Russian one, uh, a Seoul Russian one. Here, I'm not sure what element this is. Here, there are also Russian America, Russian America. Um, interesting. Yeah, a lot more Russian American. But here's also is only Russian. Here's another one. Um, but of course here's France, Great Britain is uh, Sweden is often the Germany. Mm, France also a few times Italy, um Spain. Um Finland. That's interesting. Uh and then here maybe some of other countries. Great Britain and Sweden. Anyway, let's just let's just continue. We absolutely lead the world in space exploration. We're the only people that have landed on the moon and we did it six times and played golf on it. We sent the first satellite images of other planets like Jupiter, Saturn, and even Pluto. And we were the first to land a rover on Mars. We pioneered the genome project and pioneered so many medical advancements. We donate more money for charity and aid for people in need across the world than all the other countries combined. We have the number one film industry in the world. We maybe, maybe um, uh, because you also, I mean, just a theory, but maybe and because in the United States um has not such a big uh, social welfare state, it more is um, relying on donation and um, free spending uh, than in other countries, and maybe also because they commit so much war crimes, they feel the need to um, donate more, or they're just better people. But I don't, I mean I don't think that they're better people, but um. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> it's it's just um serious and um a little bit fun and teasing. Don't don't take anything too personally what I say. Um, write down in the comments what you think about um what I say and um what you think I missed or maybe I should also um, react to if you are interested in a certain topic. Um invented so many things I'm not even gonna get into it and name them all but one of them being personal computers and the internet and YouTube which you would need to watch this video and that's just a small fraction of the heritage that your nation gets to claim and you and I are a part of it so buck up kiddo no matter how much we fight we're still family in the end and we're all kind of pretty awesome and, I and we are all citizens of the earth people of the earth we can agree on this and um, I mean I'm not American so I'm in this way definitely not your family but friends um definitely that's 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 true yeah and youtube <laughs> for sure I guess that's who we are as Americans. We're just the lost children of the world that made our own thing. And that's our heritage. And to talk more about how that heritage is subdivided regionally, here's Hannah with the culture segment. Hello everyone! We are at the America episode and you know I have to start it out with a big roll tide because you know I am from Alabama. Me and Ian and the baby. Actually the baby's not from Alabama. It's from California. Oh, you're gonna have a California baby. Oh no. <laughs> so when I say American <laughs> culture, lots of things probably pop into your head. Surfing and skateboarding, catch up, ranch dressing, pickup trucks, cowboys, pop and locking, shopping scooters, shopping scooters, yellow school buses, drinks with ice, 64 ounce cups, red solo cup, spray cans of cheese, root beer, to-go bag, carpet floors, wearing shoes indoors, and I would hear American culture. Maybe I would think first is Florida. And not Florida, but I'm saying Hollywood. Hollywood, a um, big thing of um, American culture. But, uh, and maybe big things, uh, because Americans, um, or um, United States Americans, I think, like it very much if things are big, like um, a big portion of pizza, a big, I don't know, it was food or so, at first at least. But maybe if, um, Hollywood would come up first in my mind when thinking about US American culture. And so on. These are all fun and true to some extent, but there's a deeper story behind our people. For one, culture in the USA is typically divided into five main regions within the lower 48 and micro regions within them. So let's start off. Northeasterners are hustling business folk. It is home to the Bosch Wash Corridor, the largest megalopolis in the world in terms of economic output, with about one sixth of the entire country's population. People here live in or have close access to large metropolitan centers, which most likely means they are acquainted.
acquainted with a wide range of ideas, opportunities, office buildings, and the daily grind of modern life. Funny enough, Pennsylvania is also home to the largest Amish community that chooses to avoid modern technology. The Midwest, or the Great Lakes region, is the industrial and manufacturing belt. The lakes and rivers help them prosper and trade historically. Detroit is known for its car industry, hence the nickname Motown or Motor City. Chicago processes food and machinery. Wisconsin is the dairy capital. In fact, two of the top three best hospitals in the country and in the world are here. Overall, the Midwest is good at making things and they are famous for having some of the funniest accents and nicest people in the country. Oh, don't you know? Then we get to the Great Plains and the frontier. This is the breadbasket and mountains of the nation. Basically, this is the the resource epicenter. After these lands were acquired, the U.S. government encouraged westward expansion to the citizens by implementing the Homestead Act in 1862. So basically, this became the Wild West if you've seen the classy, kitschy Americana Western films. This area also has the most Native American reservations as well. Be respectful to the tribes if you ever enter the land, as they have their own eponymous set of rules that may differ from the state they are in. Colorado is known for having the healthiest people in the country. Wyoming is one of the few places where you can still see authentic cowboys and cowgirls. Utah and Idaho have the heaviest concentration of the Mormon community. Arizona and New Mexico have a desert culture. They know how to handle heat and thrive in it. Then there's the West Coast, California, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. Basically, two things dominate this region. Entertainment, which is literally what we're doing right now on the West Coast, uh -huh. and tech innovation. Everyone knows Los Angeles is the entertainment capital of the world, home to Hollywood, where the largest and busiest studios and production facilities in the world operate. Up north, you start getting tech hubs like Silicon Valley and Seattle, the startup and innovation centers with companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Everyone knows Vegas in Nevada, the largest casino state. However, not everything is neon lights and robotics. Oregon is where the whole lumber industry pretty much started, and today some of the best alpine forests are found here, so you find more naturey people out in those parts. And finally, we reach the South, my home region, the region everyone in the U.S. is moving to right now. This is probably the most well-known, distinct region of the USA. Most people, whether religious or not, have had some kind of affiliation with the church growing up and will find themselves praying, even if they are on a reality show intended to showcase their drunken sexual escapades. And that's also because everyone knows the South is the best party place in the country. Well, tangent, because a lot of our colleges have the best football teams, reasons to to celebrate. To celebrate. Louisiana is our best kept secret. They have the unique Cajun and Creole culture that dominates everything. There's nothing like Mardi Gras on Bourbon Street, but if you want the original and real Mardi Gras, you have to go to Mobile, Alabama. And as much as I hate to admit it, the entire state of Florida is kind of a non-stop party. Even hurricanes don't stop them. Everyone knows the strangest and craziest things happen in Florida. I think it's because it's so hot and humid there. South Florida is home to Miami, which is basically North Cuba. It has a unique Caribbean culture. Literally, you need to speak Spanish. The Mississippi Delta is where so many famous people like Elvis Presley and Oprah were born. You have the Appalachian or Piedmont South where banjo and bluegrass music began and where some of the best moonshine is made. Along the coast of North and South Carolina and Georgia, you have the unique Gola community, descendants of the freed slaves that inhabit the barrier islands. They are known for speaking their own unique Creole that has West African influences, musical performances, and sweetgrass woven crafts. Then, of course, we get to Texas, the big guy. Let's just say Texas is not just a cowboy state. It's evolving into a major modern tech and entrepreneur hub. They're tough, they're proud, and they love their state. In Alaska, you can actually find bush communities that live mostly off the grid and survive in the elements and prefer bartering instead of using money. Native Hawaiians invented surfing, and they were ocean navigation experts traversing the entire Pacific on canoe. They were ocean. Um, I, I don't totally understand this regional um, nationalism, but um, here the thing also similar to people from Bravia um, are also very proud of the um, state, and uh, I don't get it. <laughs> 
navigation expert traversing the entire Pacific on canoes. Micronesians in Guam and the Marianas also have their distinct Chamorro culture, and they live by the concept of a moat and menyaina. American Samoans are obviously the cousins of the Samoans. They have their unique matai and chiefdom systems of ruling themselves, and the Fa'a Samoa, or Samoan way of life. The Virgin Islands is like a mini Jamaica. They have their own Creole English, Quell Bay, or scratch bands, amazing seafood, and the unique Malvi drink made of tree bark. Puerto Ricans are kind of like the U.S.'s favorite Latinos. Politics aside, they have created so many cultural impacts that have crept onto the mainland, especially in places like New York and Florida. Home of bombo, reggaeton, everyone knows Robert Clemente, Ricky Martin, J-Lo, Daddy Yankee, and Luis Fonzi. Of course, I don't know any of them. So that's the quick, condensed overview of J-Lo, Daddy Yankee. and Luis Fonzi. So that's the quick condensed overview of the U.S.'s regional cultures. There is so much more we could have mentioned, but it would take forever. If you are from a region of the USA with a distinct cultural trait we missed, write it in the comments and teach us. I guess with all of that, we go back to the crazy Florida region because now it is Florida Man Keith's time to talk to us about the music. Take it away, crazy Florida Man. Woo, we did it! Did it! That's the America there episode! Okay. All right, we're in Florida. Hey, uh, oh. I heard about this. Um, he visited to Keys. Uh, there was also a YouTube post about this. Keith, was... yeah, made it to Florida. Yeah. Woo, There's back. even a fight going on outside, so that's how you know it's real Florida. Hey, what's up, everybody? What's up? Name Keith. Woo! Thanks for having me on the show, Paul. I'm not trying to sound cocky or anything like that. Every other country on the face of the earth deserves its own spotlight. With all that being said, we are the number one music market in the entire world. We export more music and entertainment to the rest of the world than any other country ever. Look, but first, let's take it back, way back, to the indigenous people of the United States. Native Americans are known for their powwow events of, you know, war drums and dancing and singing and all kinds of really great traditions traditional things along with the Hawaiians who have the luau's and it's pretty amazing too and they got the fire spinning and the Inuits have their traditional throat singing that they perform <laughs> So the largest Native American powwow event in the United States is called the Gathering of the Nations. And you can go check out this event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it's performed every April. And I highly recommend you guys go and check it out. In Hawaii, you have also the Merry Monarch Festival. It's like the most Hawaiian thing you can possibly see with your own two eyes. Unless if you have one eye, then you uh, it's the most amazing thing with your one eye. Now let's fast forward. American music <laughs> really started to gain its international... I think... Um, after the United States, it's Japan with the music output, and then it's Germany. Recognition in the 1800s with things like vaudeville and acapellas. Like the Fisk Jubilee singers who broke barriers and received the National Medal of Arts. Prior to the 20th century, American music was either classical, parlor music, slash saloon music. All Americans know such songs like Home on the Range and Oh Susanna by Stephen Foster. And then something crazy happened. Jazz. Oh my god, jazz. Woo! There is nothing more American than jazz music, a very highly intellectual form of music. Jazz basically changed the entire world in, or helped shape today's modern music. I mean, you can take, you know, the chord structures, like complex chord structures, I mean, songs like Giant Steps, where you literally have every other beat where it changes like a chord, to odd time signatures. I mean, Take Five was like a very popular jazz standard that was in, by this record, uh, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Miles Davis set the standard of how good jazz can sound in my opinion but let's be real i mean you also had john coltrane in his band i mean even at points i mean bill evans was on his record today's music Music wouldn't be anything without jazz. I mean, I also want to highlight blues music just as much as jazz because without mm, this um just um, blues uh, and rock and other modern music styles um i mean some of them are good, but most, I mean, I don't really, um, like the most of it too much. One of my favorite music, um, things, uh, is the, the Ring des Nibelungen, the Ring of the Nibelungen, uh, opera, opera from, 
Okay, jetzt war ich da. Äh, but. Yeah, also, it's a lot of good musicians and music, um, things like. Um, symphonies from, uh. Elga and, um, other things. So, I'm more like classical music, um, guy, more or less. But music in general is not such a big thing for me, it's such important. Blues as well, we wouldn't have had the era of rock and roll. People like Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Gary Clark Jr. You know, without blues, we would have never gotten into eventually having Elvis Presley, to the beyond, into the Beatles and Led Zeppelin, and everybody's favorite bands at one point. It, it all kind of stems from the blues. We can't leave out what was going on in New York City with hip-hop culture. So basically, it all started with a guy named DJ Cool Hurt. It took off from there you have Detroit for Motown and how can we forget about Nashville Nashville the main thing that people see is country music but you can just as much go to indie show and go check out some indie hipster band or go check out a metal band believe it or not Nashville has the highest musicians per capita in the entire world Texas was the birthplace of Tijano every Amer Mexican American knows a uh, Selena and probably has some sort of private room in their closet uh, with a shrine dedicated dedicated to Selena. With all that being said, so many of our American artists have gained international recognition and fan base. You can be in the middle of the Himalayas going camelback and come upon a salt mine and some dude is gonna be all like, dude, have you ever checked out the Thriller record from Michael Jackson? And then he's gonna, you're gonna be like, yeah, who doesn't know Michael Jackson? Yeah, bro. Oh, there's a thriller. I'm sure this park's gonna get flagged and taken down. Anyways, I love all of you. Thanks so much for uh, having me on the America episode. My name's Keith. Good job, Keith. Yes, America. Woo! Thank you, Keith. By the way, I'm gonna see this. Here. Mm. Yeah, um. I would love to have a Soviet flag, such a bigger one. I have a small one. Um, moment. 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 I have here. A smaller one. But I wish I would have a bigger flex. I like this American flex. Um, but yeah. Maybe I will buy one one day. Just as a symbol for communism. Not so much as for the Soviet Union. But uh, for communism. Yeah. Woo! Thank you, Keith, the real original Florida man. Okay, so yeah, I'm not even gonna try and end this segment with something witty. This episode is already the longest we've ever had on the channel, so let's just jump into the final segment, shall we? The friend zone. Hmm. Um, uh, Great Britain, Canada, I guess. Uh, maybe Japan. Get along very well, but yeah, let's see. Let's see. Um, I think. Uh, we we'll maybe also mention China and Russia as um, rivalries, but yeah, we will see. When it comes to our diplomacy and foreign policy, the USA is quite deep. We have embassies in all the countries except Iran, Syria, North Korea, and Bhutan. Yeah, Bhutan is only embassies I think in India and in Bangladesh extrovert and even if there's a diplomatic strain or limited interaction in one area of the world we still have some degree of connection thanks to our incredibly diverse population and diaspora communities i literally found people from places like south sudan the solomon islands and even our rarest guest carrie from tuvalu here in the united states that's how insanely diverse and interconnected our nation is in any case the motion graphic as a member of numerous igos in asia the usa works closely with many members and has deep ties to them for example after world war ii and the korean war the u.s has invested heavily in japan and south korea and today they are the only two east asian countries with visa-free access to the u.s the philippines is super close too as they were once a u.s colony they speak english and many american cultural traits have adopted into filipino society india shares a close relationship as they make the second largest asian diaspora community in the u.s after the chinese they have huge bilateral trade deals and joint military exercises they are easy to engage with as an anglophone nation and heads of state have met numerous times with china 
China, it's almost always a complicated, extensive, economic-based relationship. And of course, there's the whole Taiwan thing. Basically, in the 70s, former President Richard Nixon visited, and soon after, the U.S.-China joint communique, and the six assurances were established. Long story short, no matter how things get, we keep doing this thing where it's like, I think I'm better than you, but I want to keep dancing with you. Otherwise, as a member of various North and South American organizations, the U.S. has very obvious and close ties to their North and South American neighbors. In the broadest sense, they are all kind of like new world countries that share a similar story of being built off of European colonialism, evolving into the vibrant new societies that they are today. The U.S. was the first country to recognize Brazil as a nation in 1808, and many sociologists will say that Brazil is kind of like the closest country resembling the U.S. in shared experiences related to their demographic makeup. The only real major difference is that Brazil was more Catholic influenced, whereas the U.S. was more Protestant. Otherwise, moving on to Africa, the U.S. cooperates in many discussions with the AU and ADB. The African Growth and Opportunity Act in 2000 provides preferential cooperation to the U.S. market for eligible African countries, such as Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And today, many African Americans do pilgrimage trips, and some even get dual citizenship. Oh yeah, and Liberia was like the U.S.'s long-lost adoptive African stepchild that we keep forgetting. We really need to pay more attention to them and give them more love. When it comes to Europe, though, basically the U.S. has always had some kind of constant interaction with Europe since the inception of our nation's independence. France was the first country to establish diplomatic relations with us. Also, thank you for giving us the Statue of Liberty. Over the years, Europeans from virtually every corner of the continent immigrated to the U.S. and built communities and neighborhoods. After World War II, we signed the Marshall Plan, which was a huge economic recovery act, which eventually evolved into the formation of NATO. The only main European relationship that has a roller coaster of diplomatic instability typically lands with Russia, rooted in the Cold War era conflict, but this is a topic for another time. When it comes to our best friends, however, typically Americans will probably root for one of the teen major Anglophone nations. Okay, let me let me guess. Uh, um, Great Britain and Canada, I think, are uh, among the um, best friends in, in America. Uh, best other countries in American would say. In my opinion, but I guess I already guess. So if you think differently, tell me. Mm, I I tip, uh, Great Britain and Canada. We Americans hardcore crush on the Aussies and Kiwis. I personally feel like nothing illustrates this more than the Irwin family. We share a history of being former British colonies. We are members of ANZUS, the Pacific Committee, and a partner in the Pacific Islands Forum. We share very common political and cultural interests. We've almost always teamed up and had each other's backs on numerous international conflicts. And yeah, overall, we love them. Then we hit a little closer to home and get to Canada and the UK. Canada is more like- Hey, I was right to- Yeah, um- <laughs> in, in a way. Like our obedient little brother that stuck with Daddy Britain as we broke away and got our own apartment. Later on, they saw us having so much fun and then kind of slowly and politely requested to leave Dad's nest. Nonetheless, in a technical sense, Canada has the oldest shared relationship with us as we were both being formed at the same time. So we ultimately really get each other and we share so much in common in regards to culture, values, and politics. We both speak English, much to the chagrin of the Quebecois. About 75 to 80 percent of their trade goes through the USA. Granted, sometimes Canadians hope they don't get too Americanized and they try to salvage their Canadian identity, whatever that means. But ultimately, we love them. We marry the crap out of each other. We hire their musicians and actors. They let us film in Vancouver for super cheap. And we love how they hate it when we call them our 51st state. Finally, we end up with the old man. Um, I see this 51st state should either be, if it ever comes to a 51st state, um, DC or Puerto Rico. I've seen videos about both of them, how it would be if they would be state 51. And UK. The US is the rebel son that broke away, yet after things cooled off, we totally laughed about it and became the closest friends all over again. Today, the two countries share the world's largest direct foreign investment partnership and virtually go hand in hand in almost every international issue. The UK is like our connection to Europe, and recently both countries have affirmed the other as being the country with the most important bilateral partnership in their foreign policy. Long story short, the story ends right where it began. The USA and UK will always look out for each other. All right, the motion graphic is over. It's time to do this. In conclusion, look, personally, if you're American- <laughs> In conclusion, normally he always says, hey, it's your part. When he has a guest in, in the video, but now it's his own country, so he do it himself. I like it.
Listen, you're my family. We don't always have to agree on everything. In fact, we might not even like each other. We might even kind of hate each other a little bit. But the point is, if you're an American, you're still my family. And at the end of the day, my family comes first. I'll still have your back. Nobody messes with my crazy family. And if you have a green card, it's like you're kind of engaged to my family and I can't wait for the wedding. If you're undocumented and you call this country your home and you love it and you work hard and you have good character and want to be a part of the family, then I'm rooting for you to take all the necessary steps to join the family. And for I, I don't understand this. Um, I would not consider... Um every German in my family. Not um I mean in the slightest, no, thank you. Um <laughs> but it, it's cute. It's cute to see this. Um yeah, but I don't understand this. <laughs> For those of you saying that we have problems, yeah, of course we have problems. We always had problems. We always will. But that's that's true. Mm. Every country has its own problems, mm. and every country should deal first with its own problem problems. So, of course, Americans, United States Americans, should deal first with their own problems before they try to help others. And the same goes for Germans, for Brits, for France, for all of the other countries. Mm. So uh, personally, I have to deal first with German problems, and if it uh, if I ever want to move somewhere else, I will do it. Maybe I will move somewhere else in Europe at some point. So let's see. Look at our history. When there was a problem, we didn't stick with it grumbling and twiddling our thumbs. We openly acknowledged it, we erupted a little bit, we let things get messy, and then we figured things out. That's kind of how we do things. We're Americans. We're still figuring things out, and we're not even 300 years old. We're just getting started. We're not done. We're never done. We don't stop. You're part of a people and nation that has done amazing things that the world has never seen before. You're part of that amazingness. It's like, by default, you Americans are already unique. You're already amazing. You just, you might not recognize it or feel it, but you are. We became our own royals. And this is our home, and I love you all. Oh, oh, shoot. Um, yeah, uh, Uruguay, stay tuned. Uruguay is coming up next. Sorry, you have to follow that. Definitive and interesting video. I liked it very much. Um. Okay, moment. I will also like it here. So, um, amazing video. I enjoyed it very much. If you also watch through my video, please um, like it also and um, subscribe to my channel. Um, my thoughts on the United States. I think uh, it is very important that every country um, first deals with, with its own problems. And um, I just wish that, for example, also the United States would not um, meddle too much in other countries' affairs, historically and also in the future, and tries to um, uh, deal, deal with their own problems first. And not, uh, for example, in Iraq or Afghanistan or other countries, go somewhere else to mess things up there, but to try to solve the problems which exist in their own country. So um, I think it's um, something they should keep in mind and maybe try to do. Of course, um, some Americans, I mean, cannot. Um, I mean, a single American can never change anything by by himself. But they they could try to um, um, elect a government which would not then mess up other countries. Um, the same the same goes also for other countries like France and UK and Germany of course or Russia or any other country in the world first solving its own problems and then helping others um uh, I hope you enjoyed this video I enjoyed it very much I will probably not travel to the United States unless say maybe um there is some change in the gun law culture and in the police um, culture. Because I personally don't want to be shot uh, by a police officer. Um, no one wants this, but I don't want to risk this getting shot for just seeing some nice things, which are also nice somewhere else. And I, I would also not like to um, visit a country where I know so, so many people have um, so 
deep problems with um the two. For example, also um, find the house or um have enough money to live. And it's uh, of course a problem in other countries as well. Like for example, Vietnam. I visited uh, recently last year. Um, but I had the girlfriend there at the time. Or when I visit the Philippines, it's also probably some people there have a worse life than some people in the United States. Um, but still, um, I have a now I have a girlfriend in the Philippines. Last year I had a girlfriend in, in Vietnam. So that's a reason. Maybe I, when I would have a girlfriend in the United States, I would also go there. But uh, I hope I will never need to find a new girlfriend because I'm happy right now in my current relationship. But yeah, in general, I like the video. Very interesting. I look forward for the other last countries, and I specifically look forward what he will do after he is finished with the buffer. And will he make some remakes to earlier episodes, like for for example Brazil, Afghanistan, and so, which were very short? And um, will he do something else? I'm not sure. I look forward to find out. And I hope you also will maybe um um watch this let's play from me. Yeah, there's a link in the description. This video is definitely the longest hour, the longest video um, I've ever made uh, for a geography episode. There are just a few, three videos I think which are longer. One stream and two Minecraft videos I think, two, both two hours or something. But either way, I hope you enjoyed it. One, two, three. Hi. Hi and welcome, uh, it's a few days later, for to be exactly, it's the 8th of July, so 4 days ago the video was published, and yeah, it's a small extra video clip where I just tell a few, tell a few more things about my opinion and so on, mm, so the video was very interesting, um, also when um, I edited the video and saw so through this everything again, it was very interesting. At the one side, I would like to visit the United States one day, but on the other side, uh, it's too risky for me, I think. Um, or what it means for me, I think it's um, too risky for anyone, but um, I don't want to visit the United States. I don't want, even if it's a small um, chance only, um, to get just shot by some crazy guy because guns are so available in this country. Mm. There are super interesting things about this country, some awful things, of course. Especially the foreign policy is awful, um, whether now in Chile or um, as I so showed you in the small clip from Hassan Abi, small, t 17 minutes or so, um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, in the, like in the video. So there are a lot of awful things which happened and the United States committed war crimes, terrible war crimes, like other countries do as well, but uh, yeah. But there are also very much interesting things. So, for example, this um, art museum, I think, in New York, uh, of modern art. I would like to visit this, for example, and other cultural things. But maybe I will do it even one day. Maybe I will be um, uh, deciding to, uh, maybe I will one day decide to do this one day. <laughs> but who knows? I don't plan this right now. I don't think it will happen. But I can also not uh, tell the future. But all around the world, all around the world, we have to change things, we have to improve ourselves, we have to um, become a real good society, and it's a long way, it will take a long while, maybe I even, maybe even we will never reach it, but I believe communism, like this flag represents, kind of, um, can achieve this. Communism can reach and build up a better world for all of us. And I'm not the best one to explain this to you, but uh, in a world where no wars are fought, where everyone um, has equal rights, where everyone has um, a possibility to um, uh, get also a, sh um, a fair part of um, what is um, produced, what is um, what the society produces, especially it's not the baker. Who um the, the bakery producing bread, or someone else produces other goods? Everything is shared equally, and everyone who needs something can get it. And it's not uh, there's no money, which is um a barrier for some people to achieve their goals. And 
it's already a very complex thing, but um, I think it's the best thing for humanity. And um, second thought, as a YouTuber, I will maybe have a link in the description. Um, if I remember to put all of the links in, I hope I do. He explains the things very well. It is a very great video about, maybe I will even have a link to this video um, called What is Socialism? Where he explains it um, for people who have not um, thought about this um, so far. Mm. Then I will also have the videos of course to Hassan Abi and uh, Vertical Living. Also to the first part of the two part videos um, from Nalf and from Radical Living. And both are about um, the how German and um, American um, culture meet. So I will have uh, links to both videos hopefully. And if you are interested in this um, Trails of Course studio game, I'm currently right now playing the second part. The first part is already completely recorded. Hundreds of gigabytes on my computer. I have just to um, bring up now the episode um, day for day. And I will hopefully bring also today, episode 25. Mm, for you yesterday, if it, um, it comes up, it comes, okay, it comes out on Sunday. But either way. I hope you, if you um, are interested in this game, uh, will give it a chance and give me a chance playing it um, as your um, host, as the let's player. It is an awesome game, I love it very much. I play it maybe in a different style than many others, but I'm, uh, I'm very, um, it's one of my most favorite games of all times. On the same level as maybe Morrowind or um, Witcher 3 Right Hunt, as I said, maybe even above Witcher 3 Right Hunt. Um, also on the same level as Gothic One, one of my most favorite games as well. So, if you want to see more um, uh, video games, if you want to see me playing more video games, also um, check out some other videos from me. I played Minecraft and some other games already, but I will also play more games. And if you have some suggestions of um, what games I should play, then please mention them also in the comments. Also mention in the comments all your opinions about everything I said. Um, I think uh, uh, when Hassan Abi told about the war crimes and the, the bad sides of American foreign policy, he's absolutely right. I think the uh, United States, the country, should uh, focus more on their own problems and not, and definitely not uh, to go in other countries and try to um, say there uh, what is right and what is wrong, mm, like they did in Chile because they didn't like the socialist president Salvador Allende. Um, made a coup happen there, so uh, don't put your nose into um, uh, affairs you have no business with and which are not in your country and um, don't uh, meddle with other countries um, democratic um, decisions like for example as well in Chile but it's all stuff which I mean I would I would need to say to the American um, government but um, also to American people who uh, think it is uh, right for what they did in for example Chile, Nicaragua, um, uh, Korea, um, Vietnam. I mean Korea and Vietnam they just fought wars which is terrible. In Nicaragua and Chile they uh, messed up with the democratic decisions of the people. Like in Cuba also uh, many times and other countries as well. I don't know all of the countries they um, uh, meddled in but uh, um, uh, there's, there are a lot of them. So, yeah. But I still hope you enjoyed this episode and you can criticize also everything I said. Do it, please do it. But, yeah. Consider what I said as well. Uh, this is the longest episode, uh, over two hours long, which I ever made um, for a Geography Now episode. It is more double the length than the original video. Please give it, of course, a like and subscribe to um, Geography Now if he makes ama amazing content. Um, uh, I will also maybe watch the Native American Reservation explained and the um, United States uh, Flag Friday video, which probably comes out at some point. But, and if you have other video suggestions, mention them as well. I love to make questions. I love to make let's plays. Yeah. I'm a communist. I'm a pacifist. So, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please like and subscribe to my channel. Watch my let's play. And one, two, three.